Thank you very much. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's really great. Good morning. It's really great to see you all here in our second international webinar on the implementation of web-based reading instruction toward 21st century education held by English Education Study Program, Faculty of Teacher Training and Education, University of Jember. Recording in progress. Honorable Dean of Faculty of Teacher Training and Education, Prof. Bambang Subano, the Chairman of Language and Arts Department, Bapak Anrofik, and the head of our study program, Ibu Eka Wahyuningsi. And our two respectable speakers, Mr. Paul Goldberg and Mr. Willy Renandia. Thank you very much for coming here. And also uh, our loving uh, audience, thank you very much for being here this early morning. Uh, I hope that everything is okay with you out there. It's a bit um, cloudy here, but I hope that you can still have a uh, lot of spirit to join our webinar today. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> I'll praise maybe to God the Almighty that we are allowed to hold this webinar uh, to share knowledge and information on the implementation of a, a base reading instruction for the 21st century education. I know. Let me tell you what we're going to have uh, this morning for this morning program. The first, it will be the opening, like what we are having right now. And the second, we are going to sing the national anthem together. And you're going to listen to the uh, hymn of University of Jember. And the next will be speech delivery from our beloved dean. And it will be followed by praying. And finally, we come to the uh, presentation session by our two esteemed speakers, and then it is also followed by Q&A. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, without further ado, let's start with the first agenda. Now, before we welcome the Dean to deliver the speech and opening remark, let's sing the national anthem and the hymn of University of Jember. Uh, Mr. David? Okay, dear audience, could you please place your right hand on <clears> your <throat> chest <throat> and let's sing uh, individually from our own place. Mr. Dave. Oh, my God. 
Mr. Dave. All right. Now the next is the speech and opening remarks from our dean, Prof. Bambang Spano. Time is yours. Silakan kami persilakan kepada Prof. Bambang untuk membuka acara untuk memberikan sambutan dan membuka acara. Monggo, Prof. Non saya masih mute, Prof. Ah, yes. Oke, okay, thank you. Uh, Mbak, siapa ini? Mbak... Bilgis, Prof. Mbak Bilgis, ya. Yeah. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. I'm glad to be here with you all in this international webinar. Thank you for your coming to the webinar conducted by our English department under the title The Implementation of Web Based reading interaction to our 21 century education. Special thank you also for the speaker today, Dr. Uh, Dr. Willy. Selamat pagi, Pak Willy. Morning. Ketemu lagi. Sugeng Enjang. <laughs> yeah, Sugeng Enjang. Thank you very much, Pak Willy. Morning, <laughs> thank you very much. And special for uh, Dr. Paul Gelbert. Thank you for your willingness to become the speaker in this webinar. My pleasure. We know that the reading plays an important role for our students. It is the skill that students need to invest in their knowledge and explore the world. <clears throat> Yet, it is not an easy thing that makes our students to have good reading habit. <clears throat> There are so many things that the teacher and parents should do to make their student kind of the reading. They have to motivate the student. They have to provide book for the student. And the most important, this is that have become to motivate for the, so that to know that I adopt in their sounding also like reading. <clears throat> Therefore, I have I hope to this webinar can give you insightful information on how to deal with all those things. <clears throat> Finally, <clears throat> I hope that this webinar will be useful for you all. <clears throat> Then, 
because the committee acts of me open this webinar, this here with I officially open this webinar. Thank you and have a nice webinar. Thank you very much, Prof. Bambang, uh, for the speech and the opening remarks. And thank you very much for uh, sparing some time with us today. Terima kasih banyak, Prof. Uh, sudah sama -sama. Yeah, you welcome. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah, most welcome, sir. All right. Now, uh, before we come to the main session of today, let's all pray together so that this program is blessed and runs without any obstacles. So I would like to invite Bapak Anrofik to lead the praying. Anrofik, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, Bilkis, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I okay. can hear you very clearly. Thank you. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, while, uh, my warmest greetings to all participants of this international webinar, especially to the Dean of the Faculty of Teacher Education and Educational Science, Professor Bambang Supano, and also the keynote speakers, Prof, uh, Professor Rob Waring, uh, Dr. Willy Renandia, Pak Willy. Kita jumpa lagi. Good morning, and then uh, Dr. Paul Goldberg, Daniel Ari Widiatama, and Ibu Made Adi Andayani. Uh, before the commencement of this international webinar, allow me to recite a prayer, and I will recite the prayer in Arabic. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajim, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallaita ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim wa barik ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama barokta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim innaka hamidum majid Allahumma anta rabbi la ilaha illa anta khalaqtani wa ana abduka wa ana ala ahdika wa wa'dika mastata'tu a'udhu bika min syarri ma sona'tu Abu ulaka bini amatika alaya wa abu ubi zambi faufirli fa inna hula yang firuzunu ba illa anta. Allahumma ini asbahtu ushidu kau ushidu hamalata arshik wa mala ikataka wa jami akhokik anna ka anta Allahula ilaha illa anta wahda kala syari kala anna Muhammadan abduka wa rasuluk. Allahumma ma asbaha bi min ni'matin aw bi ahadin min khalqik fa minka wahdaka la syarika lak fa lakal hamdu wa lakal syukru rabbana atina fid dunya hasanah wa fil akhirati hasanah wa qina adzaban nar subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun assalamun alal mursalin walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin amin amin ya rabbal alamin thank you assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Banur. All right. Now, finally, we've come to the most awaited sessions of the day. Now, the presentations from our esteemed speakers, uh, Bapak Willy Renandia from Nanyang Technological University, Singapore, and Bapak or Dr. Paul Goldberg from Kwansei Kakuen University, Japan. Uh, for, uh, yeah, some people have asked me about the attendance list. So if you are wondering, when you will get the attendance list, we are going to deliver or give it to you at the end of the webinar. And if you are watching this from YouTube, you, do not, you don't need to worry because you're going to uh, share the link later in YouTube as well. Thank you very much. All right, now for the sessions, the presentation sessions, we are going to start first with Dr. Willy Renandia, which will be um, led by Ibu Areta Buspa. Are you right. here? Yeah. Okay. Ibu Wilkis, is it clear? Uh, yeah, I can hear your ah, voice right. very clearly. All right. Ah. So I'm going to pass the floor to you, Bareta. Okay. Thank you, Ibu Wilkis. Yeah, you're All most right. welcome. Yes. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the first speaker for the these sessions. Okay. I am Areta Puspa. We lead you for the first speaker, our the outstanding speaker today. Uh, we have Bapak Dr. Willy Renandia. Hello, Pak Willy. Morning. Good morning. morning. Okay. Morning. How are you, good. Pak Willy? I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Before Pak Willy have presentations, I will read for the curriculum fitty. Okay. Bapak Dr. Willy Renandia is a language teacher educator with extensive teaching experience in Asia. He 
currently teaches applied linguistics courses at the National Institute of Education, Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. He is a frequent plenary speaker at international ELT conferences and has published, sorry, mm, wait, uh, has published plenary speaker at international ELT conferences and has extensively in the area of second language education. And his publications include language teaching methodology and anthology of current practices on 2002 and student center cooperative learning on 2019. And uh, he maintains a large language teacher professional development forum called Teacher Voices. Okay, we have the outstanding speaker for the first speaker. Okay, but really you have one hour, 45 until 50 minutes for presentations and around 10 minutes for Q&A. Thank you. Are you ready, Pak Willy? Yes, I'm ready. Right. I'm also very excited to uh, be here this morning. And uh, first of all, I would like to greet Pak pa yeah, Dekan, Pak right. pa Bambang Supano, and also my dear friend, Ibu Eka Wayuningsi, and also everyone uh, in the audience. It's a privilege for me to share one or two things about what I know about the importance of reading. But first off, I'd like to show you my campus, my university. It's a beautiful university located in Singapore. Uh, the name of the university is Nanyang Technological University. If you are from Indonesia, and if you are planning to study in my university, good news, my university is an LPDP approved university. In other words, you can apply for a scholarship from the Indonesian government in order to study uh, with us at the university. The uh, unit that I belong to is the uh, Faculty of Education or the School of Education locally known as the National Institute of Education in also in Singapore. It's part of the university. If you go to the LPDP website, you will not be able to find this School of Education because it's parked under the uh, uh, university, the Nanyang Technological University. It's one of the best uh, teacher education institutions in the world. Uh, in Singapore, it's number one. It's, it's because it's the only uh, teacher education institution in Singapore. If you want to come and study to become English language teachers or other teachers in Singapore schools, you have to come to us. You have to study with us. You have no choice. You can't go to any other uh, institutions in the world. You have to go through us. That's why it's one of the, it's the best uh, faculty of education in, uh, in Singapore. We have a range of courses, masters and also doctoral programs. In fact, one of the uh, member of the audience is an LPDP uh, scholarship recipient from Indonesia, and she is going to say hello to you later on. Her name is Maria Hidayati from UM, Universitas Negeri uh, Malang. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a question for you. And this question is something that I want to discuss with you, and I want to be able to answer together with you. Can extensive reading and listening improve language proficiency, second language proficiency? I'm going to say yes. If you're not very sure, wait. 30 minutes later, I want every one of you to be able to say, yes, Pavili, I agree with you 100%. So that is question number one that you need to be thinking about as I go through my presentation this morning. Number two very important for teachers, for Dosen in Indonesia in particular, I want you to think about how my presentation is linked, is related to the idea behind Merdeka Belajar in Indonesia. The Merdeka Belajar is loosely translated as learning beyond the campus wall, but locally it's often translated as freedom to learn. I don't think that is the right translation. The, uh, the nicer translation is learning beyond the campus wall. Yeah. So that is two questions that I want you to be thinking about as I am uh, presenting. 
Uh, here is a very brief outline. I just want to do three things. Number one, I'm going to share with you the theory and the research behind extensive reading and listening. And more importantly, its applications. What is the application of extensive reading and listening in our classroom? When we teach, when we develop our lesson, does it have any immediate and practical uh, implication? And number three, of course, is question and answer, which I usually enjoy very much. So either after my presentation or after Paul has presented, we can engage in a very productive and fruitful discussion about issues related to extensive reading and uh, extensive listening. Let's begin with the theory and the research, the what and the how of extensive reading and listening. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are interested in applying an idea into your classroom, I think the very first thing you need to know is what is the theory behind it? Why is the theory uh, important, useful for us to apply ideas into the classroom? This is particularly important if you are thinking about doing a piece of research in language education. The first thing you need to do is to understand what is the thinking behind? What is the concept behind it? What is the theory behind whatever, teaching grammar, teaching speaking. In our case, it's about extensive reading and listening. Yeah. So let me walk you through a very brief, a very simple definition or description about extensive reading and extensive listening. Now, this is what extensive reading and extensive listening is all about. It's reading and listening for pleasure. Yeah, let me say this again. It's reading and listening for pleasure. And you'll be surprised that pleasure reading and pleasure listening actually is a very, very powerful way for students, for you, for me, to develop our language proficiency. It doesn't matter whether it's Bahasa Indonesia or, or French or German or Japanese or English, pleasure reading, pleasure listening is very, very important. Yeah, the key thing to remember is pleasure. I know that some of you think that, well, anything that is pleasurable is not a very good thing to do in education. I think we are very, very wrong. There's a lot of research that tells us very clearly when it comes to literacy development, language development, language acquisition, pleasure reading, pleasure listening plays a very, very important role. Number two, another important point for us to remember is this, uh, extensive reading and extensive listening is about listening and understanding, reading and understanding for the big picture, for general information, not for detailed information. Yeah, another important thing. I want you to think about what happens when you teach reading in the classroom, whether you teach reading in Bahasa Indonesia or you teach reading in English. Usually you ask your students to read for detailed information. A lot of questions that you ask at the end of your lesson, that is not extensive reading. Extensive reading is about reading very quickly, reading for information, reading for general uh, information. And finally, something for us to remember, remember is that extensive reading and listening is not for study purposes. You don't try to read and try to remember every single thing about the content like when you are studying for an examination, for example, or for a test that happens tomorrow or the following uh, day. Yeah, so this is basically what extensive reading and extensive listening is all about. Very, very simple idea. Now, when it comes to applying the idea into the classroom, now these are four very important ideas for us to remember. As a teacher, we need to remember that extensive reading and listening work when the content, the first one, the content, the EC, the content is interesting. The content is exciting. The content is compelling. Compelling means it is something that when the students start reading or listening to a story, for example, they will want to continue doing the reading and listening until they get to the end of the story. That is compelling. I think you have all had this experience before you read something, you start on page one and you get so interested because the content is relevant to you and interesting to you. And then you continue doing it until you get to the end uh, of, the, uh, of the reading or the uh, listening materials. 
Number one is content. Content has to do with motivation. Content has to do with the intrinsic desire to do things without stopping. Number two, another important idea is this, that the language, the bahasa, the grammar, the vocabulary, the sentence structure will have to be accessible, accessible to your students. It has to be at the student's level. It cannot be something that is too difficult for the students to handle. If that happens, the students will finish, will stop reading almost immediately. They will tell you, teacher, yes, the book may be interesting, but I don't understand. I don't know because I have difficulty understanding the words, understanding the sentences, and understanding the, the other discourse features of, of, the, uh, of the materials. So these are two. The first two are very important for us to remember. Number three, number three is about quantity, about amount, how much listening, how much reading will our students need to do? The answer is a lot. The answer is it has to be massive. If you ask your students to read for one week only, for example, that is not extensive reading. It's not a bad thing for you to spend time reading for the whole week or for the whole month, but that is considered not sufficient. Extensive reading and extensive listening mean that the students read in a great quantity. The more, the better, the more, the merrier. And research tells us very clearly Research tells us very, very clearly that the amount, the quantity of reading and listening is the best predictor, is the best predictor of students' language proficiency, of students' listening and reading ability. And finally, the last point is variety. I think we all know when you go to a, uh, for example, to a restaurant for a buffet dinner, for example, yeah, if there's only like three or four dishes, then you will not be very excited because you may not be able to find the kind of dishes, you know, that you want to actually enjoy eating uh, for your dinner. The same thing with reading and listening. We need to make available a variety, a wide variety of topics, of content. Maybe a little bit about culture, maybe a little bit about uh, fiction, about uh, adventure, about travel, a wide variety. Again, this is related to the notion behind human motivation. We want to choose what we want to read and we want our students want to be able to choose what they want to listen to. Okay, so the theory actually is very simple. And this is what the theory and research has been telling me uh, for many, many uh, you know, years that I've been in the uh, in the area of doing research in listening and reading. If you read an individual piece of research, you get the impression that, well, the theory can be very complicated, actually is not. If I were to summarize the research on listening and reading, these are two of the most important things. Number one, we acquire language from reading. And number two, we acquire language from listening. So these are two of the most important skills where language learning, language acquisition is uh, concerned. Now, interestingly, if we do both, if we do read and listen over a period of time, I think we can learn a lot more. We can develop a higher level of proficiency in the language. We'll be more able to read and to listen with greater understanding. And we will also be able to speak and also to write with greater uh, accuracy and coherence. What do we learn from reading and listening actually? Here you go, yeah? We are now looking at the benefits. What are the benefits of reading and listening? I have here three major categories. Number one is the linguistic benefit. Number two is the thinking, the cognitive benefit. And number three is the feeling, the emotional, the affective benefits, yeah? Very briefly, we all teach language, right? And from reading and listening, we can expect our students to develop, to increase their word knowledge. Baba Ibu, ladies and gentlemen, 
words, words, words. These are the most important element, the most important ingredient where language learning is concerned, where literacy development is concerned. Yeah, and at the same time, not just words, we can also expect the students to get a lot of benefit from reading and listening by seeing repeatedly a wide range of grammatical structures and a wide range of text or discourse uh, structures. Yeah, so that is the power, that is the benefit of the linguistic benefit of reading and listening. Students get to see the words, students get to see the grammatical structures and text structures and other language conventions repeatedly, regularly, daily, if not uh, you know, weekly and also monthly and yearly. What about the cognitive benefits? It's very interesting. Yeah, reading requires that we have knowledge about, we have linguistic knowledge, knowledge about words and knowledge about the grammar of the language. We also need a lot of world knowledge. Yeah, reading actually with comprehension is actually not possible unless you have a lot of topical knowledge, unless you have a lot of content knowledge. In other words, world knowledge. Reading extensively, reading uh, listening uh, extensively will allow students to develop a wide range, stronger knowledge base. Knowledge is important for comprehension. Yeah, another thing is that students' thinking skills also develop, their comprehension skills also develop, their ability to make connections within the sentence or between the sentence or between paragraphs in, the, in, in, in a text uh, also develop a great deal. In other words, the ability to make inferences, to make prediction, to make uh, synthesis also improve a great deal. And all this because they've been doing reading and listening regularly over a period of time. Now, interestingly, reading and listening, if the reading and listening are pleasurable, enjoyable, the student's motivation also uh, increases. They find that reading is enjoyable, listening is enjoyable, and language learning in general is enjoyable. And when you will be the happiest teachers, when your students come to you feeling very excited and telling you, uh, teacher, teacher, I want to learn more from you because I am motivated, because I'm happy to be studying and I'm having a lot of fun learning English with you. Now, here is a, another source of information about the benefit of reading and maybe also on listening as well. Uh, this comes from not a researcher, not an academic person, but a novelist, <clears throat> somebody who has written a lot of novels, interesting novels. The name is Lisa C. And this is what she says about the benefit of reading. Read this very carefully. Yeah, I'm going to read this for you. Read a thousand books and your words will flow like a river. And that is very, very true. If you have spent time reading and also listening for a period of time, then words will come to you very easily. If you want to write, these words will you know, jump in front of you, waiting for you to use them in your essay or in your speech as well. In other words, yeah, doing a lot of reading, doing a lot of listening can help our students become more fluent readers and more fluent listeners. Please pay attention to the word fluent. This is a very, very important concept in language learning. Fluency is about the ability to do things quickly and easily. So that is what fluency is all about. I think from your experience, you know that your students have spent a lot of time studying with you, but when it comes to using the language, they struggle a great deal. Yeah, they are not able to express themselves quickly and easily. In other words, they're not very fluent, either as readers, listeners, writers, or speakers. Fluency means that the students will be able to have a deeper and greater comprehension of what they have read or listened to. In other words, they're able to process written and spoken text faster, and also more efficiently. 
So that is the, uh, uh, you know, the benefits of reading, extensive reading and listening. Let me try to uh, expand a little bit, extend a little bit and look at the uh, additional benefits of reading and listening. If your students are fluent readers, really, really fluent readers, there's a very good chance that their ability to write also increase a great deal. Yeah, so fluent readers can become fluent writers. So that is the relationship between reading and writing. People have been saying that reading and writing are two sides of the same coin. You can't actually teach writing. If your students don't write very well in your, in your, in your writing class, do not give them more writing exercises. I don't think that's going to help. You need to work on their reading skills. You need to develop their reading fluency. Once they become fluent in reading, I think they will find that it is easier for them to begin to write. The same thing with listening. Yeah. If the students are, have become fluent listeners after spending like one whole year, maybe doing a lot of listening, I think their ability to speak also improves a great deal. Again, the same, the same uh, message that I want to share with you, that I want to say to you, if your students are not able to speak well, if they struggle a great deal when they try to express themselves in English or in German or in French or whatever, do not make them to speak more because you will be sort of wasting your time. Yeah, because the source of speaking ability is listening. So if you can help your students to develop a greater level of listening proficiency, I think chances are you will find that they will be able to begin to produce the language quite easily and quite smoothly as well. Now, if you put these two together, fluent reading and fluent listening, then we can expect an overall development, an overall uh, you know, language competence in your students. In other words, we can expect them to become fluent users of the language, fluent readers, listeners, writers, and also speakers. Okay, so those are the uh, benefits. Again, let me just uh, continue by providing you, well, sharing with you uh, one or two quotations from experts. Now, these are experts uh, that I have, you know, I've, I'm very familiar with. And I've read a great deal works by uh, Stephen Krashen and also other ELT uh, scholars. Now, this is what he says about reading. Yeah, I think we need to read this very carefully. When enough reading is done, the key word here is enough reading. Yeah, the kind of reading that we ask our students to do in the classroom, not enough. Definitely not enough. When enough reading is done, all the, necess the necessary grammatical structures and discourse rules for writing will automatically be presented to the writer in sufficient quantity. So this is the reading and writing connection. Yeah. But Willie also said the same thing. I will be saying the same thing. I'm just changing the word reading to listening here. In other words, I'm just copying what Krashen said, but replacing reading with listening, because I really believe that this is what we should all know very well when we teach mm -hmm. uh, you know, language in the classroom. When enough listening is done, all the nece necessary grammatical structures and discourse rules for speaking, which can be very different from writing, will automatically be presented to the speaker in sufficient quantity. Okay, let me now share with you a, uh, a very simple, uh, you know, graphical representation of the uh, acquisition process. Now, this is what happens, yeah? If you want to learn any language, if you want to learn English, the first thing you need is input. Yeah, input can, can come from uh, the oral and uh, written input from various sources. In other words, from listening and reading. The second one, this input will have to be processed by the students. For processing to happen uh, optimally, the input will have to be comprehensible, engaging, rich, 
interesting, relevant, and all that. The next step, acquisition. Acquisition happens when the students have been exposed to a lot of language input that is comprehensible and engaging in large quantity and also in regular frequency. In other words, it has to be done daily, setiap hari, every day, the students will have to be exposed to language that is interesting, that is comprehensible, and that is engaging. And once that happens, then you can expect your students to be able to produce the language, speaking and writing uh, fluently, and also, uh, you know, in a more interesting way of presenting or expressing their ideas to other people. Now, what you want to, what you are probably wondering is, what does it look like? What does acquisition look like? What is it that we have in our head? What kind of knowledge that we have in our head that allows us to produce uh, eventually to produce language, to speak and to write, you know, beautifully mm -hmm. like Ibu Mutiara. We don't know actually very well what the system that we have in our head looks like. We don't know very much, but from what research has been able to tell us from those people who have spent years and years researching the process, the nature of language acquisition. Now, this is roughly what it looks like. Very interesting. Yeah. Again, let me read this to you. Now, this system, this acquired system, is complex, number one. Complex means it's not easy for us to describe in its entirety. If you have a book, a very big book on language, you know, on linguistics or on semantics or on grammar and things like that. That is just a very tiny, a small description of this linguistic knowledge that you have in your head. It's very, very complex. Nobody has ever, uh, you know, been able to describe this complex process in its entirety. Now, to me, what is important is this. The second one is implicit. Yeah, very, very important concept in language acquisition, that this acquired system is implicit, largely implicit. There may be a small amount of explicit knowledge that you have about the language, but largely it's implicit. And it is not dependent on learner practice of language. So practice, practice like grammar exercises, you know, uh, matching exercises, fill in the blank exercises, that, may be useful, but the uh, is not extremely useful. Yeah, researchers have now been able to determine that this complex and implicit knowledge of the language that allows you to use language actually eventually is dependent on exposure to what is called input. Please read this again and again until it sinks in, until it registers, you know, firmly in uh, you know, as part of our professional knowledge as a, as a language teacher. It took me many, many years to really understand what this means. And now I think I understand what it is and how I can apply this in, in my teaching. Okay, remember complex and implicit, yeah? Okay, let me just continue by citing another source here, a book on language acquisition. Another very important quote for us to remember. I hope you can see all the uh, connection that I'm trying to help you to make uh, in my presentation. I'm going to read this again very slowly. The ability to produce language. To produce means to speak and to write. Relatively easily for communicative purposes, not for examinations, for communicative purposes, for real language use, draws heavily on implicit knowledge. Extremely important and extremely powerful. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we have to admit that we have not done a good job in helping our students develop this implicit knowledge. The reason is very simple. We are too busy teaching our students too much explicit knowledge of the language. We teach too much grammar. We teach too much sentence structures. We, 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 we teach too much, you know, uh, reading strategies and reading skills, maybe, forgetting that these things, while they are not unimportant, they don't contribute 
directly to students' uh, English language proficiency development. Let me just give you some example. I think you want to see some real example of how uh, you know, successful learners of English actually uh, went through a process of learning that allows them to develop this implicit knowledge of the language. Now, my examples here are about, you know, high school students who are very, very successful learners of English from China. I think the same thing can be said about other successful learners in the world, from Indonesia also, from Korea, and from Japan, and from many other places. These are really, really proficient learners of English. Now, what is interesting is this, they spend many, many hours of practice. Now, pay attention to the word practice, yeah? Because the word practice here is very, very special. And I will share with you what practice means. This is what practice means. So in the case of these successful users of English, they spend a lot of time listening. In other words, they do a lot of extensive listening, actually, in order to help them to develop high level of proficiency in the language. Now, here is what some of them say, as reported in a journal article that was published uh, some years back. I think this is very familiar to you. Yeah, I was slow in the beginning. When you start learning a new language, like many of your students, they will find that listening is very painful. Listening is very slow. Yeah. The speakers may have finished talking and you are still processing. You are still trying to figure out what, what the speaker is trying to say. The same thing happens here. I was slow in the beginning and I had to listen to it many, many more times. Look at this. Gradually, slowly, just after many hours, gradually, I developed some feel for the language. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you can translate the word feel using a word, a more technical word that I used before, you can go home now. What is that word that I used earlier on? What is that word that I used early on? Implicit. Yeah, implicit is a word that we use. I mean, that people like us use, that linguists use, that, that you know, uh, ELT experts use, but students probably don't know the word implicit, yeah? They use the word feel. Feel means intuition. I know that, I know, I know the language, but I can't tell you what it is. I just know it. So this intuitive knowledge is extremely important. Ladies and gentlemen, again, this is a big job for you. How you can help your students to develop this feel of the language, this intuitive knowledge, this implicit knowledge. Let me continue. I feel that I just have Countless, countless mean many, numerous patterns sort of swimming around in my head. After doing a lot of listening, this is what happens. After doing a lot of reading, this is what happens. Words, phrases, sentences begin to form in your head without you being very conscious of it. Yeah, you feel that this, all these words waiting for me to use, all these phrases, all these language patterns waiting for me to use line sentences from movies often naturally uh, pop out. When I was a student, for example, I remember, I remember remembering a very interesting line from the movie and the movie is called Love Story. And that line uh, reads, love means never having to say that you are sorry. I still remember that because, you know, this line just appear, just, just you know, pop in my, in my, you know, in my head. Okay, Rabbi Buskalian, ladies and gentlemen, what does patterns mean? Does it refer to words? Does it refer to grammar or both? Now, the answer is both. This is what it looks like. Uh, this is what it's called. It's called lexical chants or lexical bundles. Words that come together, phrases that are more or less fixed because these words, these phrases are said together. When you meet somebody for the first time, you say, how are you? You don't think about this. You just say, how are you? And the answer is usually fine. Fine. How about you? Yeah. What time is it? I think you can answer that very quickly. It's nine o'clock. Oh, it's nine ten. You just say it very quickly. 
are you are you doing anything tonight for example are you free tonight and the answer is mm, not really what's up maybe tomorrow yeah these are words and phrases that you sort of you know uh, say together when you want to use them now here are some examples of lexical chunks or lexical phrases or idiomatic expressions if you like some example here we just have to make do with it i'm sorry but let me make it up to you uh maybe next week uh, you can make fun of me all you want, but I'm very serious about what I am trying to get across to you. The good news made my day. Make my day, they come together just like that. Yeah, please make up your mind. A lot of other examples here. This one is on me. It was lovely to see you again. Thanks for coming. I don't believe a word for it. Just looking, thanks. Let me think about it. I'll be with you in a minute. It doesn't really matter. And so on and so forth. What we know from research again is this, fluent speakers, competent users of the language, like Mutiara, like Ibu Eka, like many other people in the audience, that competent users have hundreds, if not thousands of these ready-made phrases. These are phrases that, that are ready for you to use when the situation uh, arises. Yeah, let me say that again. Proficiency, the ability to use language fluently uh, is partly because of what you have learned about these lexical phrases that you have learned over uh, the years. Here are some examples of people who have been very, very successful in developing a high level of proficiency in the language through extensive listening and through extensive reading. Okay, at this point, I would like to share with you some practical applications. How do you apply all these ideas in the classroom? I think you may be wondering, yes, yes, but really all these wonderful things are good. I understand the theory now, but how do we apply it into the classroom? Let me share with you three or four ideas about how all these beautiful ideas uh, can be implemented, can be applied in the language classroom. Point number one, Point number one, point number one, again, this comes from my discussion earlier on about the theory, the research on reading and listening, time. Time on reading, time on listening will have to be increased. So in your lesson, if you teach a reading lesson, one hour reading lesson, make sure that most of the time is used for the students to actually doing the reading and listening because it is the amount of time that is spent reading and listening that contributes to your language or your student's language development. And if you do number one, the implication is that you have to reduce the other activities that you normally do in the classroom. The brainstorming activities will have to be reduced. The predicting activities will have to be reduced. The answer comprehension questions, for example, after listening and after reading, will also have to be reduced. Reduce, 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 but increase the amount of listening and increase the amount of reading. Can it be done? The answer is yes, you can. Definitely you can. Yeah, you just need to increase the... Uh, uh, the uh, materials, as long as the materials are interesting and exciting, I think your students will want to spend more time doing the actual reading and listening in the classroom. Number two, it's another important implication. Very often, I don't know why teachers are always concerned about teaching something new to our students. I have nothing against teaching something new to our students, but please remember that language learning requires that the students see again, read again, listen again, things that they have seen, they have heard before. And that has a lot of implication. In other words, you need to recycle a lot of language in the classroom because learning happens when the students are able to see the same grammatical structures the same sentence structures again and again. So the message here is try to use accessible materials, easier materials 
and also more enjoyable listening materials and listening materials. Go ask your students. Go ask your students these questions. Number one, in my reading lesson, do you enjoy it? Number two, in my reading lesson, do you find that you are able to read with greater comprehension without help from the teacher? I think the answer to these two questions, if you ask your students and if they answer your question honestly, they will say, no, I don't enjoy listening or reading or attending your reading lesson. I think this is happening everywhere in the world. Students find that the reading and listening lesson are very challenging, too difficult, and number two, not enjoyable. I think we can change that. We are make it more interesting, make it more exciting, and make sure that the language is at their level. Some of you are worried that if the language is at their level, then they won't learn anything new. That is not true, because seeing the same thing again is a great opportunity for the students to strengthen, to consolidate what they have done before. Yeah? So recycle uh, or recycling is, is very, very uh, important. Point number two, when you're thinking, when you're designing the tasks, the reading tasks and the listening tasks, make sure that the tasks are so interesting that the students get very excited and they want to continue listening and reading beyond the classroom. Yeah, Baba Ibu, very important for us to remember because reading and listening in the classroom is not enough. The students will have to do more reading and more listening outside the classroom. And the best thing for you to do is to work on their motivation. The best thing for you to do will be to develop tasks and activities that are so exciting that the students, after the lesson is over, the students will want, teacher, please show me where I can find more information about boy and girl relationship, for example. Yeah. In other words, reading and listening must lead to more reading and more listening uh, in the classroom. Next. Again, this is one message that I've uh, been saying again and again, teach less, not more. Teach less so that the students can learn more. Do not keep on teaching something new on a daily basis. In the case of grammar, for example, I think we have to stop teaching grammar, not stop completely, but reduce the amount of teaching of the grammar of the language to a minimum. I mentioned grammar here because very often in a reading lesson, the focus is very often on teaching the grammatical structures found in the reading text. I think we have to try not to be tempted because teachers usually are very tempted. If you see something, you know, grammatical features, then you want to explain, you want to spend time explaining the grammatical features to uh, your students. Another important thing is that we need to also teach less, you know, less explicit teaching of comprehension skills, like predicting, guessing meanings from context, for example. I think that can be very interesting, that can be useful, but don't overdo it. Guessing meaning can be useful. But I think it's more useful for your students to know more words, to develop their vocabulary through reading, than to play the guessing game. Next, let the students learn more. How? Very easy. Get the students to listen again and to read again. It's a very simple idea, but some of you may be saying that, well, the students can get bored. Well, yes, they can get bored, but think about it very carefully. Mm -hmm try to come up with an idea that will make the students want to listen to the same thing again, two times, three times, four times, and so on and so forth. It's just like when you watch a very, very uh, nice movie, for example, you may want to watch the movie again, two times, maybe three times, because every time you always get something new that you missed uh, earlier on. So repeated listening, repeated reading can be uh, very useful. Another Another idea is, is this shadow reading or shadow listening. This is another very powerful strategy. 
Yeah, students listen and speak at the same time. They listen and they imitate at the same time. This is possible when the students have access to audio books. And later, my colleague from Japan, uh, Paul Goldberg, will share with you uh, his powerful digital library that allows students to read and listen at the same time. So this is a very powerful technique for improving uh, listening and uh, reading, and eventually also for uh, speaking as well. Reading while listening is another important uh, strategy that the students can use in order to develop their fluency uh, in reading and listening. Next one, maybe this is the final one, applications. Uh, some of you may be saying that my students are not motivated, my students are not interested in listening and reading. Yes, I understand that a small number of students may not be interested in reading and listening, but the majority of the students will be motivated if and only if you are a motivating and a passionate reader. If you can become a good model of your students, chances are they will also become interested in being uh, somebody like you. Show the book that you are reading to your class. If you yourself is not reading, then it's very difficult for you to share your enthusiasm with your students. I often do this when I'm teaching, when I'm teaching in my, with my, you know, my students. I would bring a book, I would mention the title, and I would tell my students why the book is so exciting. And interestingly, you know, the next day or one week later, one or two of the students will come to me and say, hey, teacher, teacher, I just borrowed the book from the library and I'm reading it now. So it's a very simple idea of passing on your enthusiasm, your interest uh, to your students. Next thing to remember is this, yeah? There is no such things as students who don't like to read. Maybe about one or 2%. The majority, what happens to the majority is this, they just have not found the books that they want to read. They have not found the books that they want to read. That is what often, Happens. Here is a true story. Now, this boy is not from Korea. This boy is uh, somebody that I know very well. He used to live together in the same house with me and my wife. So I know the, I know the boy very well. What happens was we tried to get him to read. We tried really, really, really very hard. Really? Yes. Sorry? Yes. We have 10 minutes left. 10 minutes left. Yes, I will finish it in about five minutes. Thank you. Right, uh, thank yes. You. Now, this boy, you know, we had my par uh, my wife and I had a difficult time actually getting him to be interested in reading. He would do other things except reading. Until one day, until one day, the teacher, his teacher, brought these books to his attention in the classroom. And the teacher start, you know, started reading some of the uh, uh, pages from the books. And that boy became so interested, he went home and asked me to buy these books for him. And since then, he started reading and reading and reading. He couldn't finish reading the whole collection of books written by this guy from Australia. Yeah. So again, the key message is this, if the students tell you that they are not interested, it's not because they are not motivated, it's because they have not found the books that they really, really want to read. A colleague of mine from the university, from NIE, uh, shared with me about what she did in order to find out what books secondary school students in Singapore would enjoy reading. So she gave out a survey to about 2,000 students in Singapore, and this is what she found. Now, these are books that the students really, really wanted to read. Now, surprise, surprise, do you think these books are available in the school library? The answer is mm, not really. Some schools have this collection, but the majority, they don't have this collection. So again, very important message for us. If you want your students to read, then make sure that the students can find these books in the library on in your collection. 
Okay, I'm finally at the tail end of my presentation. Yes, 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 but extensive reading and extensive listening is not easy to do. This is what teachers have been telling me, uh, teachers from Indonesia, from Thailand, and from Japan, and from many other places. Now, these are some of the reasons. They have no books, they have no listening materials, they have no reading materials. That is not true, actually. Mm -hmm. I think what you need to do is to go to the internet and you'll be surprised that there's a huge amount free books and free listening materials that you can access from the internet. Yeah. Number two, no time. No time means, well, my, my teaching is already very packed. The curriculum is already very packed. I don't have time to spend to get students opportunities to do their reading and listening. I think this is a matter of changing your priority. If you really believe that extensive reading and extensive listening really work and help your students improve on their proficiency, then you will be uh, in a position to make time for your students. The next point is, does it really work? Again, this is another important issue, important question that you need to address. Research tells us very clearly that extensive reading and listening work very, very well, but it takes time. It takes at least six months. It takes at least one year for you to be able to see the benefits for you, for the students to enjoy the full benefits of uh, reading and listening. And there are more you know, uh, questions that concerns that teachers have but I think many of these questions can be addressed if you, first of all, change your mindset about what is important in language learning and what is the kind of things that will help your students to develop the uh, implicit knowledge of the language. Yeah, this book is free for you. Later, I'll show you the uh, website. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so happy, Ibu Areta. This is the end of my presentation. I've shared with you two things, yeah. the theory and research of extensive reading and listening, All right. Thank you and very also much. the uh, really remind you of work. applications. Yes, Bu Areta, back to you. All right. All right, thank you very much, Pak Willy Renandia, for the informative and outstanding uh, presentations. All right, uh, actually, we have three questions, Pak Willy. Yeah. All uh, right, the first question is from Alfie Triani. I think that uh, she is my, our student. And uh, the question is, is that the same process between extensive reading and speed reading? Ah. There are some similarities and there are some differences. If you mean by speed reading is reading very, very quickly, no. Speed reading is possible for you and for me because we are proficient readers, because we know a lot about the content. We can read very quickly. We can skip a lot of words. We can skip a lot of sentences, or we can often skip the whole paragraph. Yeah, but that is speed reading. Uh, yeah. Extensive reading is reading fairly quickly, not reading word by word, slowly and painfully, but reading in idea units, reading in phrases, reading in a bigger chunks of the, uh, of the language. Yeah, so reading fairly quickly, not slowly, but really fast, no. I think we need to, for students, we need to help them to read reasonably faster, but not super, super fast. Uh, speed reading has its own place. I think speed reading can help the students to read a little bit faster. But if you are thinking about somebody like Paul who can read, you know, one whole book for two minutes, that's not the kind of uh, extensive reading that I'm referring to. Okay, thank you, Pak Willy. Yeah. And we go to the second questions from Diki Wichaksono. And um, Mr. Willy, how can we yes. find reading as a pleasure when it comes to reading articles? for our <laughs> undergraduate research. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay, I have, I have two comments on that. Number one, generally yeah. speaking, reading academic text yeah. is, not is not pleasurable. Okay. Yeah, so pleasure okay. reading usually is associated with reading, uh, you know, for recreation, reading, Oh, yeah. stories, reading novels, reading 
uh, maybe reading the newspaper as well, when you are able to read for general information. That's point number one. Point number two, can reading articles be enjoyable? The answer is yes, it can. But you need to find the contents that you are really, really passionate about. If you gave me a book on linguistics, for example, on generative linguistics or on semantics, for example, I will just put it away. I am not interested and I don't want to read it, basically. I, I, I did, you know, when I was a student. I don't want to read it anymore. But if you give me something related to language learning, to literacy development, to on extensive reading or listening, a new research article, then yes, I'll be very excited. It can be very, very pleasurable for me. So yes, two things. Okay, okay. Please note it from uh, Pak Willy suggestions here, Diki. So you can continue your undergraduate research here. Yeah? Okay. We go to the next questions, Pak Willy from mm. Muhammad Basuni. Uh, is it advisable to set extensive reading and oh, sorry, what is ES as a curricular courses since the meeting hour is limited to 50 minutes per credit? Mm. The answer is yes. Can you integrate mm -hmm. extensive reading and listening into your curriculum? The answer is yes, mm -hmm. and yes, and yes. I think you should. Yeah. Uh, if, if you ask me, because your curriculum is already very fixed, very, very compact, and, and there's already a lot. Uh, one thing that I would suggest mm -hmm. is this. I think in most universities, semester one, the students have to require have to take what is called grammar one. And in semester two, yeah. students will have to take another course called grammar number two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you ask me, I will replace them. I will replace grammar one and grammar two with extensive reading one and extensive reading two. Yeah. I think students have studied too much grammar from primary school to secondary school to high school. And when they get to your university, to your English department, to your English department, they have to learn again. They have to study again the same grammar. Do you think they will enjoy doing it? Do you think they will learn a lot from it? My answer is they will learn something about the grammar of the language, which is useful for their tests of grammar. But will it contribute to their English language development? Mm. Okay. I don't think so. Yeah. And the research is very clear. Our experience also will support it very clearly that grammar knowledge, explicit grammar knowledge enables you to explain mm. grammar knowledge to your students, explain. Mm. We will be able to use it for speaking, for writing a little bit, maybe about 10, 15%. Yeah, the 80% of so comes from your implicit grammar knowledge. So invite me <clears throat> to look at your SATO curriculum and I will be able to give you suggestions for you to think about. I think grammar one and grammar two must go. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you, but really, actually, we have two more que questions, but really, yeah, ah, uh, yeah. Uh, the next question from Okta: How to motivate our students to read English books since we don't speak English in Indonesia for our daily language? Mm. Very, very interesting. Yes, again, <clears throat> my answer is this: Students don't read in Bahasa Indonesia because, because because they are busy doing other things, number one. And number two, because they probably don't know that reading is very pleasurable in, in Bahasa Indonesia or in any other language, yeah? But yes, I would agree that it's easier if you are already a reader in Bahasa Indonesia, then it is easier for you to transition, to uh, pick up uh, you know, another reading habit in the second language. Uh, yesterday, I had a session on extensive reading with Professor Richard Day. And he shared his experience of helping his students who were not readers in their first language, but who were beginning to pick up, you know, reading habits in the second language. Now, what is interesting is that after the students have developed this reading habit in the second language, English, 
Now the students started to enjoy reading in their first language. Is that interesting? Yeah. So yes, I think if you can get your English language students to be interested in reading in English, you'll be surprised that they will also slowly and, and gradually develop interest in reading in Bahasa Indonesia as well. So the reverse uh, effect, if you like. Okay. Yeah, okay. One more question from Sahat Samosir. As a teacher, yeah. how to provide students with guidance to deal with difficulties of the materials according to familiarity of topic, mm. length mm. and complexity of structure mm. and possible number of unfamiliar words or expressions mm. as overloading learners to we to yes. sorry, mm. Mm. may involve them in decoding vocabulary and the expenses of reading for meaning. Yes, uh, that is the focus of the next session, actually. Uh, you oh. may have heard that there's a huge number of books, story okay. books, novels that are specially written for students. Okay. So these books have been very carefully written in order to address the needs of students from different levels of proficiency. So you'll be able to find very easy books mm -hmm. and books that are of medium difficulty and books that are of advanced level. And Paul uh, Goldberg will later talk about how important it is for us teachers to make available graded reading and listening materials okay. yeah now if you are able to make available all these materials then it's no longer an issue because students can just choose the ones that are that they are able to read with comprehension without help and number two ones that they they are likely to enjoy uh, doing the reading and uh, the listening Yes, let me, let me just invite one member of the audience. Uh, mm -hmm. She is from Thailand, Ajahn Mintra. Are you here, Ajahn Mintra? Yes. Good ah, morning, everyone. Yes, let me introduce to you Hello. Ajahn Mintra. Yeah. Ajahn Happy Mintra yeah. is a language instructor, is a language uh, professor teaching mm -hmm. at the uh, Chulalongkorn uh, Language Institute, Chulalongkorn University Language Institute. Now, she recently decided to implement extensive reading with her students, 5,000 of her students. And maybe she can share one or two things about her experience with us. I think, I think you will find it useful. Ajahn, Ajahn means miss or ibu. Ajahn oh, Mintra. Okay. Yes, Ajahn Mintra, okay. please go ahead. Thank you for giving me this opportunity, Ajahn Willy. Um, so, Swadika, everyone, I'm Mintra Puri Panyawanit, a lecturer from Jalalongkorn University Language Institute. And as Dr. Winley said, that um, we involved over 5,000 students of first year students from 18 faculties and more than 60 teachers from the university to implement this extensive reading program. Well, first thing first, it was our first time doing this last year. And we didn't really, you know, have much background or knowledge about extensive reading, but luckily our director um, is wholehearted uh, an advocate of reading. So she sees the importance of reading and wanted to incorporate that into the curriculum. So that was a very important step because if you want it to happen, you need to involve from the administration level down to the classroom level. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, we need to involve everyone basically. And how that happens, you know, basically before this program, I used to think that students didn't really enjoy reading. But what I did not realize was the fact that maybe it had to do with the materials we let our students read. Well, think about the course book, very, quite very, um, I would say boring passages, even for myself as a teacher. So the students had to, you know, read what they're not really interested in and maybe the language 
uh, level, there's not really match their proficiency level. So basically, you give them some kind of uh, a pill that they don't really want to take. Now, after the implementation of the ER program, with the integration of X reading, uh, an online library of you know over thousand four hundred graded readers, there you give them the materials that they can find and explore what they would like to read. And that's exactly what happened. You know, later on, I discovered through my research projects. And that was something that really was rewarding for me as a teacher implementing the program. Because all of the students told me, wow, teacher, thank you so much for bringing this opportunity to us because we now for the first time got to realize that reading Reading is in fact very enjoyable. And that was because we let them have the freedom to choose what they wanted to read at their own level and then just immerse themselves into that experience. So if you're thinking about implementing this program into your own program, just do it. And you know, um, it was um, difficult for us even though we were basically newcomers to this, mm. you know, if there's a will, there's always mm. a way. Thank yes. you. Yes, mm. excellent, excellent point. I think the important message uh, from Ajahn Mitra and from many other teachers who are implementing extensive reading is this, the teachers must, you know, be willing to try. And number two, the teachers must have the support of the uh, top management. So in Jember it's Ibu Eka, yeah. in Jember it is Bam Bang, mm. and the higher you know <laughs> top management people uh, at the university, uh, with 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 support from 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 the teachers and also from the uh, university, I think the program can be uh, very very successful. I mentioned earlier on about Merdeka Belajar. Yeah, reading when students spend a lot of time on reading, developing their literacy. I think that is one of the best ways for the students to spend time learning beyond the campus wall. So I can see the link here between reading and also listening and, and the implementation of the Merdeka um, Belajar in uh, Indonesia. Any other questions, Ibu? Okay, actually we have another questions, but we mm. have limited time, so mm. we can't continue for the sessions, but really so yeah. sorry. And so sorry for another, what was that, another questions. And uh, yeah, we have uh, five minutes before we close the these sessions with Pat Willy. And our committee, we have something for you, Pat Willy. Thank you very much for your uh, outstanding uh, presentations, Pak Willy. Thank you. Okay, Thank pa, you very pa David, much. Pak David, can you share screen? Okay, okay, Pak Willy, this is for you. Okay, please give applause for Pak Willy. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Appreciate that very yeah, much. Thank you, Pak Willy, for uh, again and again. Thank you very much for your informative and uh, very useful presentations. And thank you very much for Ajahn Mintra for sharing your experience. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'm back to Ibu Mutiara Bilkis. All right. Thank you very much. All right. That. Yeah. Okay, Pak Willy, okay. that was really astounding and very fruitful and insightful. That I uh, hope that it will open your mind about uh, how extensive reading and extensive listening is actually very useful for your students. So not, no more focusing too much on the grammar, but focus on the implicit knowledge inside. It's okay. All right, and thank you very much for Ajentra for uh, giving some testimony on uh, how you actually put... Uh, the extensive reading into practice. And I hope that we all can mm -hmm. apply that in Indonesia. All right. Okay, now let's uh, come to the next session of the presentation, which will be delivered by Dr. Paul Goldberg. And it will be uh, led by Ibu Eka Wahyuning as the moderator. Ibu Eka. Okay, okay thank you. you. Yeah. 
Thank you, uh, Bu Bilkis. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am the second. I'm going to be the moderator for the second session with Paul Goldberg. And uh, before having his presentation, let me read a little bit about uh, his curriculum vitae. So, uh, Paul Goldberg is a native New Yorker, and he has an MS in secondary education from Dwelling College in New York and an MA in Tissol from Long Island University. And he also completed the coursework on ABD for an EDD in Tissol at Temple University. And he has taught English as a foreign language in Venezuela, Spain, Korea, the US, and most recently at Kwansei Gakuin University in Osaka, Japan. He also has done teacher training for many years, specializing in communicative activities and his main areas of interest are extensive reading and extensive listening and finally Paul is the founder of X Reading which he developed because of his desire to make credit readers more accessible for students and extensive reading programs easier for teachers to manage so now uh, Ibu Bapa, dear ladies and gentlemen uh, let's welcome Paul Gerbert. Uh, Paul time is yours Okay, thank you very much. I'm honored to be here. Just make sure you can all hear me. Yes. Okay. Um, I've traveled all over the world. I've never been to Indonesia. I was actually supposed to be there this week for a big conference, which has been postponed. Uh, so I'm just very happy I can join you all on Zoom. Um, and I'd like to tell you about my experience with extensive reading and helping students to do it. So I'm going to share my screen. Oh, no, I'm not. It says I do not have permission. Help me. Wait a minute. I don't think you all want to see me speaking here without the slides. Yes. You have become the co-host. Okay. I think you yes, can. Okay. Thank you so much. I will start to share my screen and start my PowerPoint. And just to confirm, you can see my screen now, correct? Yes. Great. OK, as pointed out, I, I am in Osaka, Japan right now, uh, but I'm not Japanese. I'm from New York and very happy to be speaking with everybody. Um, um, typically, I start my presentation with a introduction of extensive reading. However, Willie did such a great job telling everybody about extensive reading. I'm going to just make a very brief summary. Um, like I said, you could. You could, someone could speak for hours about what is extensive reading. I have abbreviated it to one sentence. It's reading large quantities of text that is easy for students to understand. Okay, and both those points are very important. Uh, it's based on Stephen Krashen's input hypothesis. As Willie talked about, if students are exposed to large quantities of language that they understand, they will begin to acquire that language. Okay. Um, the main benefits or the, the basic principles are students are reading for meaning, not reading for grammar or reading for vocabulary. They're reading to understand a story. Uh, the text is relatively long and has few unknown words, which is why graded readers are very suitable. Uh, the emphasis is on fluency over accuracy. Students should be re reading as quickly as possible as long as they understand the story. Okay, They don't need to understand every word. Uh, the main benefits are students see a purpose to reading and will enjoy. Of course, it's not enjoying the same as maybe going to Disneyland, but compared to doing typical grammar exercises or vocabulary memorization, engaging with a story is a lot more enjoyable for students. Uh, the recycling of vocabulary, which leads to learning. Uh, in other words, students are going to see the words they're familiar with that they might have learned in their textbook but they don't really know how to use them. It's through extensive reading and seeing those words used repeatedly in different contexts is how they really get to learn those words, okay? Uh, and reading speed and fluency improve. And this is important to point out because even in places where students' main goal is to pass a standardized test like TOEFL, TOEIC, IELTS, they need to be able to read and they need to be able to read quickly. So extensive reading is going to help them even on those kind of tests. 
Okay, I think Willie made a lot of good points why extensive reading is very important and very necessary. I'm just going to do the same thing. I, I have my own way uh, of explaining why extensive reading is essential. Uh, in honor of the Olympics, which just passed, I am going to give an analogy related to tennis. Okay, I think everybody knows the game tennis. Uh, even if you haven't played it, you can imagine if this little guy wants to become the best tennis player he can possibly be, what does he have to do? Okay, and I think pretty much everybody would give the same answer. He has to practice the skills, serving, backhand, forehand, uh, footwork, strategy. Those are all the skills of tennis. But if somebody only practices the skills, will they become a really great tennis player? I'm going to argue no. They're going to be great at the skills, but they need to actually use those skills in a meaningful way. So what else do they need besides practicing the skills? They need to practice playing. No tennis coach would ever tell their students, just practice the skills. You don't have to practice actually playing a game. That's not so important. That's ridiculous. But it happens all the time in language education. Learn these grammar rules, memorize this vocabulary, practice this pronunciation with very little time being spent using those skills in a meaningful way. That's what extensive reading is doing. It's not replacing the learning of skills, it's taking those skills and applying them. Okay, and that's why it's so important. For those of you who like more empirical evidence, there's a lot of research. I suggest you go to the ER Foundation's website if you want to see various studies. The one I always like to mention is one actually here from Japan where the researchers found that students made significant gains in their English ability when they read 200,000 words. Now, 200,000 words might sound like a lot, and it is, but I'm gonna show you right now why extensive reading is so important, okay? Uh, if you can just get your students to read 15 minutes per day, it's going to be possible, okay? So I'm gonna compare extensive reading and intensive reading, okay? In extensive reading, reading easy books, students can typically read 150 words a minute. Not their first book, but after they've read a few books, that's the speed they can read. If they read just 15 minutes per day, to reach 200,000 words will take 1,333 minutes. If you divide that by days, it's about 88 days. It, it's quite a while, it's not gonna happen overnight. But with intensive reading, when I say intensive reading, I'm talking about a very difficult reading passage. What makes it difficult? Lots of unknown words. If there's lots of unknown words, what does a student need to understand? They need the dictionary. Does the dictionary have one meaning per word? No, it has multiple meanings per word. So how does the student know which is the correct meaning? They have to jump back to the text, try to guess from the context, go back to the dictionary, confirm which is the correct one. In that context, the average reading speed is 17 words per minute. The student reads 15 minutes per day. How long will it take to reach 200,000 words? About 11,000 minutes. If you divide that by days, over two years. So I think that makes a very, very strong case why extensive reading is so important. Uh, 88 days is not so short, but that's actually just one semester and it's a lot shorter than two years. Okay, um, so that's kind of, I think just summarizing what Willie had said. Now I'm gonna get into the practical issue. When I got to Japan, I implemented an extensive reading program uh, with my students. I just first heard about it uh, reading some articles from Richard Day and Rob Waring, who I believe is speaking tomorrow for your, uh, your seminar, your webinar. And I read some articles they had written about extensive reading and how useful it was. So I implemented it in my university classes. And it was wonderful. Uh, my students' reading speed improved tremendously, more than any other students in the university. Their TOEFL score, which they were measured on, also increased. And very importantly, at the end of the year, in their course evaluations, they said the most enjoyable part of any English class they were taking was extensive reading. The feeling they got when they completed their first book, plus they liked talking to their classmates in class, that was one of the activities, about the book they had read. Okay, so it was overly successful. However, as a teacher, I ran into a lot of logistical problems, and I spoke to colleagues, and they had similar problems. 
For example, a lack of books. If you don't have books, you don't have extensive reading at that time. So not all schools were fortunate to have enough books. Uh, and as Willie pointed out, you don't need just a few books. You need a lot of books because you have to have all different levels because your students are at various levels, I imagine, from very low beginner to advanced. So you need a lot of books for every kind of student. And every student has different interests. Some students like romance, some students like horror, some students like adventure, some students like nonfiction. So really, you need to have a lot of books if extensive reading is going to work. Also, class sets. A class set means enough copies of a book for every student to read the same book. Now, in extensive reading, typically students are choosing their own book, and that's great. It gives them a real sense of empowerment. They can choose what they enjoy most. However, there are benefits to having students read the same book because they can engage in more interesting activities. For example, discussions. The discussion, if they've read different books, is limited. If they've read the same book, they can have much more interesting discussions about the book that they read, shared knowledge. Monitoring if students are actually reading. In traditional reading classes, all students are reading the same book. The teacher can then give a test. But what do you do if you have 25 or 45 students, each student choosing their own book week after week? It becomes a nightmare for the teacher to track. Uh, if students are doing it for their own personal enrichment, that's great, we don't have to track. But I believe most of us are teaching in academic institutions where grading is a reality and the grading should be connected to the student effort. And therefore monitoring is extremely important. And so is tracking. Very, again, the same idea. You need to know what your students are doing because we have to give them grades at the end of the semester and it should be based on what they've read. Getting students to read regularly. When I would tell my students, I, I was very fortunate to teach in a good university um, and not the top university like Willie's, but a good university. And when I would tell my students, you need to read 20 books this semester, Almost every student would do it, which is great, except almost every student would wait until the last week of the semester. Not really what I want. Okay, I think many of you have experienced that. Audio, Willie repeated multiple times how important it is for students to practice listening, especially to something they understand. It's fabulous. Almost every publisher of graded readers makes an audio narration of their book. But kind of shocking, in the year 2021, almost every publisher still puts the audio on a CD. Who has CDs anymore? I think some of our students don't even know what a CD is. Uh, so again, not very useful. Uh, and finally, accessibility for students. Books are typically kept in the library. Uh, and the library isn't always accessible. And I was thinking the weekend, holiday, nighttime, never mind global pandemics when nobody's even coming to campus. So again, makes it very, very difficult to do extensive reading. Because of all these problems, I thought there has to be a solution. And I searched at this time, this is about 10 years ago, I couldn't find anything that was suitable. I said, you know what? I'm gonna make my own solution. And that solution is XREDL, which is a virtual library of graded readers students can access anywhere, anytime, with no limitations. The mission is simply making extensive reading easier for teachers, more accessible for students, and profitable for publishers. And I'll explain that in a moment. I, I do need to say at this moment that extended X reading is not a free service. There are free services out there, which I'll mention at the end. But as you'll see as I get more into the presentation, that there's reasons why X reading cannot be free. A quick overview. It's an online library of over 1,400 graded readers from almost every major publisher. And this is why X Reading cannot be free, because to persuade these publishers to put their books on X Reading, they have to be paid because that's how they stay in business. Okay. Um, also, I, uh, I think Willie and I didn't realize, and maybe Willie realized. Uh, graded readers are extremely common in Japan. Everybody knows what they are. I'm not sure how common they are in Indonesia, so I'll just take one minute to explain. A graded reader is a simple book, but they're graded uh, on level. So in other words, let's take Cambridge University. They have a series of graded readers. They have seven levels from very easy to more advanced, okay? They are graded by 
vocabulary. In other words, the lowest level books have easy vocabulary and the high level books, the vocabulary becomes more challenging, okay? The point is these are not children's books. These are books written for adults, engaging stories uh, about teenagers or university students or sometimes retold classics, uh, but told with controlled vocabulary and controlled grammar so students at any ability can find books that are suitable for them. Okay. Uh, an important point with X reading, it gives unlimited simultaneous use. That means every student can read the same book at the same time. Every one of those 1400 books can be a class reader. Works on computers and mobile devices. They can read on their phone, anything they want. Uh, we have the audio integrated and a standardized level system. So you don't have to worry each Publisher has their own levels. Cambridge has six levels. Cengage has 12 levels. The X reading uh, level system puts them all together. This digital library is then linked to a learner management system. I think now everybody knows what a learner management system is Google uh, Classroom, Microsoft Teams, uh, Blackboard, Moodle. Those are all examples. The benefit of integrating X reading into a library, it allows teachers to track all of their students' reading progress. Not just which books they read, but how many words they read, how many minutes they read, things like that. You can assess their understanding of the story, you can guide their selection to certain books, and you can assign activities. Okay, as I said, it works on computers, works on tablets, works on smartphones. An important point is we use adaptive text, not PDF. On a computer or tablet, it makes almost no difference. On a smartphone, which is where most students are reading, it makes a huge difference. This is adaptive text. This is a PDF. Okay, you can imagine if you wanna read a PDF, what is a student going to have to do? Pinching and zooming, not really convenient for reading a book. Okay, with adaptive text, you can increase the size of the font, make it suitable for whatever device you're reading. Uh, also wanna point out, uh, we have books, like I said, at 14 different levels from very easy beginner with only 50 to 100 different words all the way, sorry, you can't see at the bottom, about uh, level 14 with 3,600 words, books from many publishers, and a total variety of genres. Okay, I'd like to now show you what does X reading actually look like for students. Ooh. Okay. It has three steps. Students can uh, log in, they select a book and read, okay? Um, so I'm gonna give you a, a quick demonstration what students do when they log in the first time, they see these add book uh, button. They press that button and they can see the library of all the books. They can browse or narrow by your typical criteria, genre, level, publisher, things like that. They can start reading a book immediately or there's a yellow button here that says more information. This is supposed to be like going to the real library. They can see the back cover summary and the metadata, how many words uh, are in the book, uh, the genre, how many minutes is the audio, things like that. They can see text preview, okay? They can read the first 5% before they choose the book. Audio preview, they can listen to the first minute of the book before they choose it. Uh, I think it's very important is students often complain one of the most difficult aspects of extensive reading is keeping track of all the characters, especially with unfamiliar names. So we are in the process of adding a character list for every book that students can refer to while they're reading and see who the different characters are. You notice we also indicate the importance of the character because students don't know who is important, who is not, who should they remember. So this will be very helpful for them. And maybe most important of all are ratings. I wish I could say every graded reader in the world is wonderful, but like everything else, there are some better ones, some not so good. Because we want our students to find the best books, as Willie said, we want our students to be compelled by the book that they are reading. We want them to find the books that other that are the best books. And the best way to do that is by allowing students to rate a book when they finish, and then the students can see those ratings. Okay. And I think that is the best way. Teachers have their opinions, which are good books, but I think students of being usually of a different generation might have their ideas. 
And this is a great way for them to find the best books. The student says, yes, this is the book I want. They can press select. This is what it looks like on a computer. Most important to notice, there's a progress bar at the top left over here. When I press the next button, you see the book moves, moves to the next page and the progress bar moves forward. I could press previous and go back, but I'm gonna continue going forward through the book and the progress bar moves forward, okay? When a student stops reading, it will save their position and they can uh, log out. When they come back later on, they log in, it will bring them right back to the same chapter they were reading before, okay? When a student closes the book, we can see their reading data. A student can see their own data and the teacher can see the data for all of their students. So we can see here, we are reading A Little Princess. It's level two. The book has 2,044 words. The system tracks how many words we've read, 326. Of course, it doesn't know if the student really read, but that's how many words were on the page. More importantly, in my opinion, it tracks their reading time, 22 seconds. This is extremely, and therefore, sorry, therefore it can calculate their reading speed, 445 words per minute. This is extremely important for two reasons. Number one, as we've discussed repeatedly today, fluency is an important part of extensive reading, reading speed. But most teachers have no idea what their students' reading speed is. This is a great way for students to track their students' reading speed, find out who is reading too slowly, maybe suggest some reading strategies for them, or suggest easier books. Also, I, I don't know in Indonesia, in Japan, students are generally very honest, but we do have some cheaters. And this is a very, very good way of catching students who've been cheating. Uh, as Willie pointed out before, I think that the average reading speed of a native speaker is about 300 words per minute. And I'm certain none of my students in freshman English class in Japan are reading 445 words per minute. I can tell very quickly that this student was just flipping through the book and I could catch them. Okay, I'm a nice guy. I don't like to confront students. So maybe on the second day of class, I will just say to this student, uh, Toshiko, uh, congratulations, finishing your first book in English, 5,552 words. That's great. Um, but I see you did the whole thing in two minutes right before class today. Can you please explain that? And she will know she's been caught. You might worry, well, next time a student who really wants to cheat will open the book, and just kind of walk away for a few minutes, maybe use Facebook or Instagram or whatever is popular, not so easy because we have an activity timer built into the book. So if a student opens the book and walks away or goes to Facebook, after one minute, there'll be a silent pop-up that says, hello, are you really here? If the student doesn't reply immediately, the book closes automatically. Okay, so I would never say X reading can prevent all cheating, but it certainly makes it quite challenging, hopefully challenging enough that the student will realize, eh, I might as well just read, okay? Um, some additional features for students. It's an online system. Some students prefer print, some students prefer digital. Uh, but one thing to point out, digital gives some very big advantages in that you can change the size of the print, you can change the margin, you can even change the background color, which could be very useful depending where the student is reading. We also have quizzes for every book. And as Willie pointed out, extensive reading isn't about activities. It's not about answering questions. So these are specially designed quizzes that are not tricky. They're not difficult. They just ask major details. If the student has read the book, they're almost guaranteed to pass, probably get 100. Okay, so I believe these quizzes are actually motivating for students because it allows them to show everybody, especially their teacher, that yes, indeed, I did read this book because I can answer five simple questions, okay? Uh, students can rate books when they finish and, and make a short review. That's where we get the ratings from. Very importantly, as I mentioned before, and as Willie talked about, audio is important. You don't have to go looking for a CD or a CD player, which is probably much harder to find. They just have to press the play button and they can listen while they're reading. However, there are some distinct differences between extensive reading and extensive listening. A major one is speed, okay? Who decides a student's reading speed? Of course, the student, and every student has their own reading speed. But who decides the listening speed? The speaker. 
and that may not match the student's ability. Therefore, we have integrated five speed, the original provided by the publisher, 10% slower, 20% slower, 10% faster, and 20% faster. But very importantly to mention, without distortion. So it's not like speeding up the audio on YouTube or your audio player where it's going to sound very strange. It actually sounds very natural. Uh, I think I have enough time. I'm going to let you listen to a quick sample. Um, think about your students and this speed. This is the one from the publisher. What do you think? Is this going to be too fast or too slow? It plays for about 20 seconds. You ready? Chapter one, down the rabbit hole. Alice was beginning to get very bored. She and her sister were sitting under the trees. Her sister was reading, but Alice had nothing to do. Okay, I don't know your students, everybody has their own students, uh, but from my experience, even for my low level students, that would be too slow. They can read faster than that audio that the publisher created. So we're gonna put it at level five. This is speeding it up 20%. Let's see how strange that sounds, ready? Alice was beginning to get very bored. She and her sister were sitting under the trees. Okay, I think you'd agree that sounds quite natural for 20% faster. Just as a comparison, this is exactly the same speed, 20% faster without removing the distortion. Chapter one, down the rabbit hole. Alice was beginning to get very bored. She and her sister were sitting under the trees. Her sister was reading, but Alice had nothing to do. Okay, so you can see it makes a big difference to remove the uh, distortion. Okay, another point, I don't know in Indonesia, in Japan, most students' reading ability is much stronger than their listening ability. Okay, that's not universal. In some countries, listening ability is stronger than reading ability. The reason I mention this, because reading and listening at the same time can be very beneficial. But if students are doing it for a long period of time, I believe that they will default to their stronger skill. In other words, a Japanese student will read and listen for three or four minutes. And after that, they just get too tired. Their brain gets tired from processing a foreign language and they will actually stop listening and focus mainly on the text. The audio will kind of just become sound in the background. So what do you do if you want your students to focus on listening then? Or just focus on reading? Well, we added a setting here called text and audio accessibility. You can turn off the audio or you can turn off the text. I don't suggest turning off both. Anyway, so if you decide to turn off the audio, you can imagine the play button will disappear. But what if you do allow audio only and no text? What will happen? This is what the students will see. They can still see the pictures. They know what chapter they're on. They can listen to the audio. They just are not able to read the text. Okay, on to the teacher side. Because we're all teachers, what do teachers get out of this? Well, number one is you can view all of your students' reading data very, very easily. When I log in, I can see every one of my classes and get a quick summary what they're doing. Okay, I then can select one class and I can see every student and I instantly know how many books they read, how many words they read, how many minutes they read, their average reading speed and their average quiz score. I can filter this by specific dates. If I want to see what they've done this semester or this past week, very easy. If I want to download it to Excel, very easy. Okay. And how about each student? I can select one specific student, Mark Twain, and I can see every book the student has read, when they read, how much he read. Notice there's some pink here. That simply means the student did not pass the quiz or they read too quickly. In other words, the system will automatically detect this for the teacher if they want them to. Okay, and then if the student complains, oh, you know, teacher, I was taking a quiz and my phone battery died, the teacher can just go to the managed reading data and reset the quiz for the student. It gives the teacher total control over anything they want. Okay, a very important feature we added this year when students suddenly had to be studying, uh, when classes had to be conducted online, 
is teachers were worried. I tell my students to read, but I don't know if they're really reading because I'm in my house and they're in their houses. So we added a feature called Live Monitor, and you can see it right here. So these are my students in my class. If I press Live Monitor, it takes a moment, and it will tell me exactly what my students are doing at this moment. Okay, so uh, gray means that they're not logged in, means they're probably absent. Green is either they're reading a book or going in the website. Pink are the troublemakers. Those are the ones who have logged in recently. They're in class, but they're not on the X reading website. Okay, they're doing Facebook or something else, so the teacher can easily catch them. Okay. Uh, another important feature for the teacher is the ability to restrict the library. In other words, we have 1,400 books in X reading, but you might not want your students to read every book. So on these different criteria, um, for example, level, these are the 14 levels in X reading. You can just uncheck some levels and students will not see those books. Uh, or words in a story. I tell my students read one book a week. I don't want them choosing a very short book. So I will uncheck the very short books. And when they go to the library, they won't see them. Uh, let's say you want all of your students to read one book, a class reader, one week. Okay, this week we're all going to read a book called um, Egghead. Egghead is a wonderful book. It won some awards for uh, language learners. So I've gone to select specific titles and I check only Egghead. Okay, when I submit the student, this is now the student side. The student sees add book, guess what? The only book they can add is Egghead. Okay, so it makes it, again, gives teacher total control. Uh, X Reading uh, launched about seven years ago and we are constantly adding more books and constantly adding more features. Uh, this is what we have planned for this year and next year, a speed reading component. Uh, extensive reading definitely helps students improve their reading fluency. Uh, however, a dedicated speed reading practice, in other words, students encounter a very short, easy passage and try to read as quickly as they can, day after day, a different passage. Within a couple of weeks, they can greatly increase their reading speed. Uh, Pre-reading activities, basically every book is going to have a couple of words students don't know. In most books, they have a glossary. What we are doing in X reading is we're going to make an interactive glossary and they can take a short test before they read the book to let them know, to help them learn the word that they will need for that specific book. Journals, uh, where students can write a summary, a reaction, uh, anything the teacher wants, the student can write and the teacher can check it if they want to, okay? Um, and a leaderboard for competitions. If you want your students to compete to see who's the best reader in a class or best reader in uh, the school. X reading for independent authors. We have found in Japan, we have the big publishers, Cambridge, Macmillan, Cengage, and they have wonderful books, but we've discovered that sometimes teachers can actually write better books than the publishers because they know their students. So we have been inviting teachers to add their own books to X reading and we pay them the same as we pay the publishers. Uh, we haven't had any authors from Indonesia yet, but I hope someday we will. And finally, an interactive dictionary. Uh, this will allow students like this, while they're reading, they can select a word they don't know, get the word, meaning, Ideally, it will connect them to the meaning specific to this text. In other words, the word field has so many meanings, but in this story, it's a place to play sports. And that's the meaning they will get. That word will then get saved to their personal word list. And we will give them games and activities using spaced repetition to help them learn their vocabulary words. So X3 will go from being a extensive reading platform to an extensive reading and vocabulary learning platform, but connecting the two as they should be. Okay. And that's pretty much the end of my presentation. I appreciate it. There's a couple of things. I know you have some questions. If anybody needs to contact me, if anybody's interested, uh, as I said earlier, X reading is not free, but we can give a free trial to teachers. So if anybody wants, please contact me at this address. 
Also, I'm sorry for not including a, a slide, but if anybody's interested in extensive reading, there's actually a huge conference coming, the biggest conference of the year, the extensive reading around the world. It's going to start this Thursday. Um, and you can go to this website. It was supposed to be in Indonesia. It's now online. But next year, God willing, uh, we will be in person in Jogjakarta, I think. Uh, so again, if you're interested in learning more about extensive reading, please join this conference. Uh, you can go to that website again or email me. OK, uh, should we take uh, time for questions? Or for more questions for Willie and myself, what's the best way to work it? Yes, uh, I think uh, we can go to the question and answer session, but uh, there are not any questions. There are not any questions yet, so I am going to give you the the questions, Paul. Uh, <laughs> it seems to me that uh, oh, I said the website is very interesting because uh, it is not. In that website, we cannot only find uh, different types of level, different types of, uh, or is that different types of grades uh, of the text, and but we can also have the questions. But then uh, something that perhaps becomes uh, the curiosity of most of us is that whether this website is free or not. That is, that is usually, uh, well, is that something that all of us want to know? Okay, yeah, it's a very important question. And unfortunately, I cannot make it reading free because I have to pay the publishers. Same as, I don't know in Indonesia if you have uh, a Netflix or yes. Amazon Prime, of course they have to pay the movie studios. So X reading, unfortunately, cannot be free. It, it's quite, I think, quite inexpensive. In Indonesia, the standard price is, uh, I don't know, in Indonesian money, but it's about $14 per year. Uh, $4? Four, four, sorry, $14. $14, 14, 14 dollars. okay. But we do give a discount to institutions, about a 20% discount. So it comes out to be about one US dollar per month for students. Uh, however, there are free alternatives. I, I saw someone in the chat earlier today uh, mentioned a website, I forget the news, but like uh, news in English or something like that. If whoever entered that in the chat could do it again. Uh, there's also ER Central. Okay, yes. ER Central is a fabulous website. It's similar to X Reading. Um, I think X Reading is better <laughs> um, because it's, a, it's much more polished, but ER Central is free. Uh, and I believe Rob Waring, who's created that system, will be discussing it tomorrow as well. Okay. Uh, the thing with X Reading is you just have a, a, you have the books from the major publishers, and we are constantly uh, maintaining it and adding new features that will hopefully be helpful for teachers. Uh, yes. Uh, you you may be wondering if there are universities in Indonesia who have been using X Reading. And the answer is yes. I think quite a number of universities are using X reading at the moment. And one university uh, is Universitas Negeri Malang. And uh, let me call upon a member in the audience, Maria Hidayati. Oh, I think she, yeah, she is from Universitas Negeri Malang. Maya, are you there? Maya. Yes, Maria, you. Yes. Uh, yeah, can you yes. My voice? yes, your video on, please. The uh, video is off. Yes. Maria Hidayati is a senior uh, docent, and she is currently a doctoral student uh, in my university. Yes. Maria, tell us about X reading and uh, whether UM has been using X reading and also. Uh, about your research. I think you are researching uh, X reading as well, yeah? Bu Maria? Yes, Maria. yes. Okay, thank you, but really, for the chance. Good morning, everyone. My name is Maria Hedayati. I'm from Universitas Timalang, and at the moment, I am in my second year of uh, dissertation program, and I'm working on extensive reading and listening to improve uh, students' spoken performance and for the implementation or for the the process, uh, I intend to subscribe X reading so that the students could be exposed with 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 extensive reading 
activities and also extensive listening because I'm well aware that this virtual library could, what is it, could be set by exposing students with, with reading and also exposing students with listening activities. So it will be very helpful for me to do my research by using X reading. Mm. Thank you. I think that's it, but really. Is it enough or should I ask for more? Probably everyone can come to my confirmation seminar. <laughs> yes, we will be glad to, Bu Maria. So perhaps you can invite us to come to your seminar to listen to uh, your how is it, uh, your theory and your uh, the, pra the practice that you have done so far in UM. Mm. Yeah, and, and just as Willie said, I, I think there's about 15 different universities in Indonesia. I, I didn't prepare a list, but it, it's mm. the number is growing. Uh, as uh, the speaker before, uh, Mintra pointed out in Thailand, it's being used at, at some of the top universities and, and is expanding there as well. Um, and it's very good for research. Anybody who needs to do research, because all the data is saved for the teacher. You don't have to ask your students, how much did you read? How many minutes did you read? How many words did you read? It's all right there. So it's really an ideal tool for doing research. I would guess right now there's probably about 50 teachers around the world using X reading to conduct their research because it makes it so easy. And I hope that next year it is going to be our faculty. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Hopefully, uh, yeah. Pray for us. <laughs> With us the best. <laughs> because everything depends on so many different yeah different things yep uh, yeah. uh one one thing that i want to ask uh paul is that uh, sometimes all the teachers have provided have tried to provide the students so many different types of books so many different voices uh the same theme but having a uh, different vocabulary different levels of vocabulary or uh, in your term it is recycle but then uh the, the most difficult thing for us is to to, to improve the student's motivation. So it seems to me that uh, improving student's motivation or asking the students to begin on reading is not something that is an easy thing for us, especially for uh, those who are living in a very remote area. So what can you say about that one, Paul? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Actually, you'll have to invite me to come back again because <laughs> I have an entire presentation on that very topic, which is, you know, X reading gives you the tools. It gives all the books that its school needs, but it doesn't actually make students want to read. Okay, that, that's your question, right? Is how do you actually motivate students to read? Yes. Yeah, and that's a, a very good question. In Japan, X reading is being used by about 300 universities and high schools. And many teachers mistakenly think, wow, X reading is wonderful. It solves all the problems, books, tracking, audio. My students will love it. But the reality is reading is challenging. It's work for students. So X reading is not a magic pill to get students to read. It just brings them, it's like, uh, it's bringing them to water, but to get them to drink, you have to motivate them. And there's a lot of strategies. Like I said, I have an entire presentation on them. I would say the most important, number one, it has to be part of the grade. Okay, many people think extensive reading is fun. Students will do it voluntarily. They don't need to be graded. It doesn't work that way. Students are busy people. If they're not being rewarded, they're going to spend their time doing something else. Okay, another important point, and then Willie said this before, the teacher has to create engaging activities. Okay, if the student is reading at home and it has no connection to the classroom activity, they are going to have less motivation. But if they know that they're going to be reading at home and come to class and they're gonna to have to do something, even a five minute activity, if they know that five minute activity is dependent on reading something the night before, they are going to do the reading. The trick for the teacher is to come up with the activity. So my personal favorite one is I have students read the same book. But then as their homework assignment, they have to, by themselves, decide what would a sequel to that book look like. Okay, so let's say five students or even 25 students read the same book. Each one of them is going to have their own idea about a sequel. Okay, 
So when they get together, they're going to be very interested to hear about their classmates' ideas. For example, maybe it was a romance book and they have to write a sequel. And the other student, one student is like, yeah, oh, you know, I had the, the man and the woman get married and have children and very happily. And the other student might be, oh, I made a murder-suicide. It's really up to the students and they're very curious to hear each other's um, uh, outcome, what the sequel would look like. Another activity that I don't know if you're familiar with Paul Nation, but he often talks about uh, a 432, where students need to talk to a partner about a book for four minutes, then they change partners and speak for three minutes, then change partners and speak for two minutes, giving the same information, meaning they need to speak more fluently. Okay, so those are the kind of activities that teachers can do to motivate their students. And there's dozens more, and I'm constantly hearing from creative teachers activities that they've come up with as well. Okay, so Eka, I hope that answers your question. If, if not, uh, let me know and I'll, I'll try to provide more information. Yes, uh, so I think it is also challenging for teachers, not only for mm -hmm. students, but it is also challenging for teachers because they have to uh, create, um, said they have to be creative in creating uh, the engaging activities, but uh, but then, uh, besides being uh, besides uh, being able to create the engaging activities, I think that teachers should also be the the model for students because it is going to be impossible for the students to uh, to be keen on reading if the teachers themselves are was that do not mm. like reading. So I think, uh, Baba Ibu, it depends on us. It depends on the teachers themselves uh, whether uh, our students are going to be keen on reading or not, be, uh, because they are going to. Uh, what was that? They are going to imitate what teachers are doing. Is that Paul or uh, Bart Willie? Yes, absolutely true. Uh, I think we can link the uh, discussion with the uh, national, uh, you know, literacy uh, movement, Gerakan Literasi uh, Nasional. I think the idea is not for an individual teacher to, you know, to to work alone, but it is for the whole school, for the whole university, to start building the uh, culture of reading. When reading becomes the uh, culture of the university, of the school, then students will soon see that reading is, is, is an important part of their life. Reading is an important part of the uh, lessons that they're attending. And what we can do in a classroom actually is we try to add more reading into every single lesson that we teach. When we yeah. teach grammar, make sure that the students have you know access to a number of interesting reading materials or listening materials that contain you know whatever grammatical features they are teaching to your students when you teach speaking the same way students very often are not able to express themselves because they have not seen how words are expressed you know how ideas are expressed in words in sentences and so on and so forth in your reading lesson, make sure that, you, that, that your students read not just one reading passage, but maybe three, four, or five reading passages. The same thing in your writing lesson. Make sure that the students have, you know, have read or, or are exposed to a number of you know, uh, reading passages related or text passages related to what they are uh, going to write later on. In other words, if we can make reading an important part of our lesson, not just English lesson, but also other lessons uh, at the university, I think we will begin to see that reading becomes, you know, uh, an important part of students' life. And one day they will just look at reading as, as something that they, you know, that just need to do. It's not something that is forced upon them, but yeah. something that they really want to do because that's an important part of their life. So yeah. the importance of building the culture of reading. Yeah. Well, well, huh? At one point, uh, I agree with everything Willie said. It has to be part of the school. You have to get teacher buy-in. Um, you know, I think the tennis analogy, whatever it is, you, you need to get your teachers to believe it <clears> and understand <throat> the importance so they will motivate their students. Uh, but specific, uh, speaking specifically to uh, Eka's point about uh, teachers as a role model, I had read that teachers should read in the classroom while their students are reading. That's very important. And I honestly didn't believe it. I thought my students don't care if I'm reading. I, have, I want to grade exams while they are reading in class. 
My students can read for 10 minutes in class. I'm going to use that 10 minutes to do my work. But then you see all these graded readers behind me. I had to start writing quizzes. So in class, again, I need to work for my 10 minutes while they're reading. I started reading the books to make the quizzes. And I immediately noticed a difference in the students' attitudes. When they saw me reading, their attitude toward reading, I can't explain it. I don't know why it happened, but absolutely reading in the classroom while they were reading definitely seemed to have some effect on the entire atmosphere of the classroom. It was something like either they thought, well, if our teacher is doing it, it must be worth doing. I don't know what it was, but I do have to say, you know, since you brought up that point, it is really, for some reason, if a teacher reads with the students, uh, it seems to have some magical effect. I don't, I don't know why or how big of an effect, but it definitely did. Yes, so I do believe that uh, the uh, students are going to imitate what the teachers are doing. So if we are teaching, uh, if we are reading in the classroom, then uh, sooner or later, our students are going to, to read something. Uh, and then uh, there is one question in our YouTube channel. Is there any feature or menu for teachers to conduct initial identification of their students' reading level in X reading? Is there any feature or is there any menu, specific menu for teachers uh, to, to know the initial identification of the student's reading level? Yes, great. Uh, to, to, to shorten my presentation a little, I took out one slide and that was the slide I took out. There, there is a placement test. Uh, it's developed by Tom Robb, who created the, who was one of the founders of the ER Foundation. And it's a test specifically to find out students reading level in extensive reading, how it matches the X reading level. In other words, X reading has 14 levels. Where does a student fit? However, a caveat, I've become a strong believer that students, no matter what their level, should start with the easiest books possible. Because if they're not a good reader, that will be the perfect level for them. If they are a good reader, they will look at those easy books and get through them very quickly. They will improve their reading fluency, even if it's just for two or three days, and then slowly move up to the books that they feel are suitable for them. So I, I and many teachers, I think, had the mistaken belief that we need to match our students' reading ability with the levels of the books. But I don't believe that anymore. When you choose a textbook, something you're going to use for the whole year, you need to make sure it's the appropriate level for your students. With graded readers, students could read 20, 30, or 40 books, maybe 100 books. So it doesn't matter so much. If they choose a book that's not of their level, just try to read it anyway, or get rid of it and choose another book. So I, I would say it is, we do have a placement test, but really the most important thing is just get your students to read, choose some easy books, and then they'll find their own level naturally. Okay, I hope that answers the, the, the question that was asked. Yes, yeah, so uh, for those who asked that question in our YouTube channel, then that is the answer. Uh, X reading also provides a placement test uh, so that the teachers are going to know whether uh, uh, in what level their students are. And I think uh, uh, it is also something that the teachers should do, that they have to provide so many different types of books. Don't you think so, Paul? Mm -hmm. Teachers have to provide students' books. Absolutely. That's why I created X reading is yeah. and why I, even with 1400 books i'm still trying to add more uh because you know there's such a variety of interests and i mean at every genre we have books at every level or at every level we have books at every genre but it's still good to have more um and we're actually going to be adding books written by students uh again because other students might find them interesting but yeah uh, what, what willie said and, and what um stephen Krashen always says one of the keys to successful extensive reading is for students to find books that they find compelling. And everybody has their own taste. So our idea, our goal is to put books that will match every taste and every level. Yeah. And teachers are not going to be able to provide books if they themselves do not read books so that they cannot tell the students, uh, ah, this is a very good book for you to read. Or oh, that one is, uh, uh, or is that that, that that book uh, is suitable for your level? Uh, I don't think that they, they can do it. They cannot provide books if they themselves uh, do not like reading books. 
So, Bapak Ibu, uh, as teachers, uh, I do hope that we like reading books and we like sharing uh, sharing the books that we are reading to our students uh, to discuss the content of the books in our class uh, because I do believe that uh, we can, mm -hmm. what is that, uh, the topic that we find in our, in the book that we are reading can also become the, the topic of our discussion in speaking class or uh, the topic of uh, the, to the topic that the students have to write down in mm -hmm. writing on a paper. So the most important thing I think is reading, reading, read and read and read a lot of books, uh, a lot and different types of books. Is that Paul? Uh, oh. I'm not sure is that, uh, yeah, I, I think, yeah, the, the key is to just give students a lot of opportunities to read and give them extrinsic motivation, like I said, create activities, games, rewards, competitions. Students are not going to be excited to read in the beginning. There's too many other distractions that they're used to these days, whether it's YouTube, uh, movies, chatting, Facebook, Instagram. So we do need to, to motivate them. We can't just say, oh, here's a lot of books you'll enjoy reading. Mm. So we, we, need, we need to take both approaches. Yes. Give them a lot of books, but also give them reason. Mm. Yes, two, two, two benefits for teachers as well. Uh, teachers who read regularly, who read a great deal, are more likely to, number one, develop a higher level of English language proficiency. I think their English proficiency will go up all the way to C1, hopefully C2. I think research will support this idea. And number two, teachers who read a great deal also are more likely to be more interesting and more able to relate to the uh, diverse interest of your students. So teachers who read are likely to be more interesting. Come to my class and you will find my lesson to be very interesting as well, because I read a great deal and I know a lot of culture, a lot of history, a lot of other information that I can, you know, I can share with my students. I can connect better with my students. Ask Rob Waring. Rob Waring is here. He's a great reader. And currently he is reading Homo Deus, a very big 500 page long book by Yufal Harari. Okay, Rob, uh, Rob are, you, uh, are you here? I think he is here. Yes, there yeah, you go. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, perhaps you can say something, Rob. About that book, Rob. Summarize in one sentence. Summarize. <laughs> oh, it's a fantastic book. Uh, it takes a lot of time to read. But it's really, really mind bending. It's something mm -hmm. that makes you really, really think. And uh, there are lots of good books that are like that. So uh, please, please look out, look, look for the top 100 best books to read in your interest. Mm -hmm. And I think there are three series of that book, uh, probably, is it? That so, is correct, yes. The second series, I think. Yes, the first one is Homo sapiens, the second one is Homo deus. And the third book is, these are all very big books uh, written by Yufal Harari. And the third book, really exciting. The one that I like the most is 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. Yes. Wonderful, wonderful book. Yes. Uh, so I think uh, we come to the end of our uh, Paul session, uh, Bapak Ibu. So something that we can uh, we can conclude from Paul is that uh, Paul provides us uh, different types uh, of levels, students' levels, and if we are willing to, then we can use uh, the books provided in that website uh, for our students for, uh, yeah, perhaps for extensive reading or extensive listening in our class. Uh, so I think that's all for today's session. Uh, David? Are you there? Uh, I think we are going to give the appreciation to Paul. So, Paul, uh, this is for our, from us. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge to us. Thank you very much. Okay, Bubilkis, uh, I give the floor back to you. All right. Thank you very much, Vega. And uh, Paul, that was really, what is it, stupendous. I, I do personally think that X-reading is have it all. <laughs> like, 
uh, you have all the tracking that I think Indonesian teachers and all lecturers in Indonesia do need. And I hope we will have that in the future, Beka. <laughs> yeah. That that was really helpful. Uh, and uh, yeah. especially because I, I do believe that Pak Dekan is still here. Pak Dekan is here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, uh, yeah, we do uh, hope that if has any chance uh, to subscribe that. that I mean, I mean, <laughs> that is what we uh, we are most hopeful for, and that we can uh, make a subscription for you at the X reading because that's really wonderful and really cool mm -hmm. because uh, it has all the features that a teacher needs to. Mm -hmm. make uh, reading classes successful or like extensive reading successful. And like what Paul said before, yeah, X reading is a tool, but it won't work if a teacher doesn't have a creative activity uh, to work with that. So I do hope that uh, we do not only depend on the tools itself, but we still have to keep our mind open and think of possible activities that we can uh, do in the class with our students. All right, thank you one more time. Okay, now finally we come to the end of our session, but before that, I uh, was informed that Pat Willy is about to share something with us and Paul as well. Are you, Pat Willy? To have further discussion. Uh, no, further discussion. Uh, because I do believe that there are still some questions that you Oh, I see, yes. If you have any questions, yes, let us know. Uh, <laughs> Paul and I will be very happy to entertain you. And, it, and if you don't know the answer, and then we've got Rob Waring here with us. So. <laughs> yes, and it's such an Ajahn, honor. And also Ajahn Mintra, and also Ajahn Maria Hidayati. Maria, are you still there? The first one from Pak Hanung, uh, mm. Bu Bilkis. I have yeah, a question. Okay. Oh, yeah, right, Pak Hanung. Yeah, Pak Willy, I'm here. here. Good. Pak Hanung, you're free to uh, ask Pak Willy or Paul, or if. If you want to ask uh, Prof. Waring, then they will also be welcome. Is that okay, sir? Okay. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. So I have time now to ask Pak Willy? Yes. Yes. yes okay. Uh, I'm, I agree to uh, Pak Willy say things about extensive reading and extensive listening is very important and very basic for developing our skills in English. But the question is, but really, uh, people mm. here, teacher especially, interested in looking the learning result more than the enjoyment of learning. Mm. And the problem with uh, extensive listening and extensive reading, like what you said, is not part of the uh, learning material because the students need to... Uh, be creative with uh, the self, finding the materials and things like that. So it's a bit harder to measure. The first question is, then is the good time to measure the learning uh, result for extensive uh, reading and listening? Because we also talk about self-paced uh, learning also, right, but, uh, Willy? Mm. Yeah, yes. so my question is, if people are curious about the learning mm. research, how can we uh, take advantage of extensive uh, reading and extensive listening? Yes, the, uh, the result of doing extensive reading and extensive listening are not immediate. If, if, if students read for one week, I don't think you will be able to see any, uh, you know, any results, any visible results, if you like. Uh, extensive reading and listening takes quite a bit of time. Uh, the improvement is there, but very often it's difficult for us to measure the improvement. Uh, after three months, for example, chances are the, re the students will be able to read fairly quickly, but the improvement from very slow reading to fairly quickly reading uh, is, is usually rather difficult to measure. But after six months, I would say six months, I think ah. improvement in fluency can be measured. I think you'll be able to see uh, improvement in the student's ability to read uh, smoothly, you know, quickly and easily can be measured. I think research tells us uh, very clearly that uh, reading fluency is one of the first major improvements that the students are able to make 
after spending time doing a lot of reading and a lot of listening. If you are interested in seeing results in you know, test scores, for example, or examination scores, I think that's going to take a little bit longer. I would say at least one year. After one year, I think you will be able to see major improvements in uh, students' ability to handle you know, grammatical features in the language, in their ability to use words for speaking and for writing also improve a great deal. Not so much in terms of the number of words, but in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the depth of their knowledge of these words, the kind of knowledge that is very, very useful for the students because this is the kind of knowledge that the students can translate, can use, can transfer almost immediately for speaking and also for writing purposes. Rob. Could I just make a point? Um, people who ask the question about how long is it going to take to learn to read in your second language, let's think about the question, how long did it take you to re learn to read to be fluent in your first language? So it took you from age of three or four to maybe a decade, more than a decade before you could read anything fluently mm. and uh, in a very rich, uh, engaging way. So we should not expect that students who meet English only a few hours a week to suddenly increase their reading fluency. This is going to take a long time. It's part of their career. And our job as teachers is to make sure that we sow the seeds of this love of reading so they will continue to read beyond our classes, as uh, mm. Willie said, <clears throat> learning beyond the campus wall. Mm. Yes, uh, but Hanung, let's, let's look at, you know, the amount of time that we have spent teaching grammar. And you'll be surprised how many hours we have spent, you know, uh -huh. teaching our students grammar from primary school, secondary school, all the way to high school. And even at the university level, we continue to teach our students grammar. What have they learned from learning all this grammatical, you know, explicit grammatical knowledge? Not very much. little, actually, yes. very little. If you use the, uh, the genre-based approach to language teaching or the text-based approach to language teaching, for example, I think we spend a lot of time teaching students about the structure of a story. Or I was, I was really surprised when some teachers actually teach the structure of an anecdote, the structure of a humor, what is that for, actually? Uh -huh. That is knowledge about you know, how to create a text. But that knowledge does not translate to a student's ability to speak, to use the language. Yeah. So my, my advice to you is I think we should start thinking about how we can reduce or replace some of the things that we have been teaching for many, many years, either you know, at the school level or even at the university level. So that is that will be my advice. And, and, and one potentially uh, useful thing that you can do to help the students develop their English language proficiency is to introduce, to integrate extensive reading and listening in your curriculum. Yeah, in your curriculum. And some universities in Indonesia actually have uh, created, have added very, uh, you know, uh, a special course called extensive reading and extensive listening. So if you are looking for a course syllabus, for example, what does it look like? What does an extensive reading course at the university level look like? You just come to me, uh, send me a, a message and I'll be able to connect you with some of my colleagues teaching at universities in Yogyakarta, in Salatiga, and some other places, and they'll be happy to share with you their course content, their course curriculum. So it's in the okay. same way that you know, we, are, we are used to teaching grammar. So we have a lot of materials about grammar, you know, uh, exercise and things like that. But only a few of us know about extensive reading and extensive listening and how it can be included in our teaching. So that is something that we need to, you know, uh, work on to need, you know, to look forward to in the future. Yeah, thank you very much, Pramili. And yes. Rob and Paul, thank you very much. Yes, Mas Hanung.
All right. Thank you very much, Hanong. And that's really interesting. I do think we need to revise lots of things in our curriculum. Right? I, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Right. There are still many of us who are uh, well, just focusing too much on grammar and mm. what is it? Set aside the most important thing actually inside. Mm. Right. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Now we have a question. Uh, raising hands from Bulefi Nafianti. Would you like to ask a question? Yes. Thank you, okay. Tatiana. Thank you okay, very much. Okay. Most welcome. Hello, about Willy, Paul, and Rob. Hi. Yes, Hello. I'm staring at the screen from the beginning, actually. And oh, very I good. have, yeah, I have a lot of questions in my head, and I would like mm. to share some of uh, some of my questions to all of you. I found expert, right? So I have to use this moments with a very, very uh, hard work of thinking. I have two questions actually. Uh, well, I'm teaching grammar for about five years in my university. Mm -hmm. um, and they have taught me to teach reading, but I always refuse it back to the cultures of Indonesian students that reading is a very boring lesson, you know, mm. very boring subject. And also perhaps the lectures is a very boring lecture too. <laughs> so um, I'm trying to try another aspect to teach reading based on another skill, such as uh, grammar, my uh, what we call a specific uh, uh, subject. Uh, I'm trying to teach grammar, but I use an integrated skill with others and also um, to come uh, use a community function as a goal. Mm. I mean, um, for example, I always ask my students to learn or to read uh, several texts or several stories that they uh, interest, and then they have to analyze the grammar based on the meeting uh, lesson that I've taught in the class. Mm. And the result is very great, but really. Yes. You, you, you are right. I mean, they have more than one advantage. They know mm. exactly the rule. They can explain it in communicative English. And they know the story of uh, what they read. So mm. the comprehending a story and analyzing the grammar and also elaborate their understanding. It's a mm. three aspect of advantages only in one lesson, grammar, English grammar. But I have questions. Uh, for five years uh, teaching grammar, try to integrate with another skills and also try to uh, use uh, community competence as the goal of my grammar class. My question is perhaps to all of the experts here, but really Rob and Paul, I really need to uh, listen to the answers carefully. I mean, <laughs> this is very important for me. Well, actually, what is the keyword for reading that uh, we should always bring to the class, even we have a different level of students? The keyword, perhaps the difference of keyword between uh, different level of students, whether a beginner, intermediate, and advanced students, but the keyword of reading that we should always uh, be brought to the classroom so that the students will enjoy reading and they know exactly mm. why they should learn uh, reading, English reading in this case. That's mm. the first question. And the second one, maybe Pak really knows a lot about Indonesian cultures, especially for reading aspect. So what do you think that the lecturers should do? The lectures, yeah, not, not uh, for uh, intermediates uh, or uh, beginners. The lecturers do in um, what we call uh, involving students with one integrated way so that they know, okay, English is very important, not only uh, the grammar, not only the speaking, but all of mm. them, but start from reading. That's mm. Pak Willy and uh, Paul mm. and Rob. Please, yes. I'm waiting for the answers. Thank you. Yes, uh, very quick response. And then uh, Paul and Rob uh, can continue. Uh, <clears throat> number one, I think you keep mentioning on the word grammar. <laughs> and uh, you know you you are you are probably asking us whether grammar is important or not important. My answer, and I think Rob will agree, Paul will agree as well. Every one of you will agree that grammar is important. Mm -hmm. No question about that. Mm -hmm. If you want to learn a language, you need to know the grammar of Absolutely. the language. Mm -hmm. But more important than that is how do we know the grammar of the language? What is the process of learning that grammar? Again, there are two ways of doing it. Number one is by explaining the rules, by explaining, uh, you know, by, by, by providing explanations to our students about the rules of the grammar and how the uh, words are formed in, in a sentence and things like that, very explicitly, the way that we normally do in a classroom. Yeah, that is one way of doing it, explicit teaching of grammar. And then grammar is probably presented or taught according to some sequence 
maybe easy grammar first and then gradually moving from yeah. easy to the more difficult ones. That is one way of doing it. And that is how schools actually are teaching grammar in many parts of the world. The other way, which we think is more powerful, more interesting, and more in line with research and with our own experience is that grammar uh, will have to be acquired implicitly. I think I mentioned early on, I took uh, one very interesting quote that the ability to speak, the ability to write, the ability to use language for communicative purposes draws heavily on implicit knowledge of the language. Implicit knowledge of the language means explicit, uh, implicit, not explicit, implicit grammar as well. So the big question then is, how do we acquire this implicit knowledge, implicit grammar of the language? There's no other way. It has to be, it has to be done through reading and listening, not through explicit or direct explanation. Now, having said that, I need to say that, well, what is then the use of explicit teaching of grammar in the classroom? Is it useful? I would say, yes, it is. In particular, for if you are training people to become English language teachers, then yes, they need to know a lot about explicit grammar of the language. Yeah. But for most of your students, I don't think they need a lot of this explicit grammar. They probably need about 20%. I mean, this is something that comes, you know, you know, off the top of my head, about 20%, maybe the rest will have to be implicit or even lower. Yeah, Rob says even lower than that. So teachers, if you have been teaching explicit grammar, if you've been teaching grammar explicitly in the classroom, spending hours and hours explaining the subjunctive, the relative clauses and the sub, you know, adverbial clauses to your students, I think you should, you should stop doing it or reduce it to a very, very minimum. If your goal of teaching is to help your students to develop this ability to use the language for uh, communication, for authentic, real communication, not just for examinations, yeah. Now, interestingly, people who read a great deal, students who read and listen a great deal, they may not be able to explain grammatical rules to you, but their performance on examinations are always above you know, the average students. In fact, they are likely to be, to, be, to be much, much better than students who have spent years and years learning or studying grammar explicitly in the classroom. So that will be my initial, you know, thought for you. I think Paul and Rob probably has a lot more to say. Mm -hmm. Rob, do you? Yeah, Rob is frozen. <laughs> No, I'm not frozen. I'm just waiting. For <laughs> um, I think you you answered the question. You asked the question before about you know uh, interesting materials and and practice. Um, you answered the question yourself when you were talking mm -hmm. about motivating students. How do we motivate students? Well, bring in interesting materials. That will solve ninety five percent of your problems. If you don't have interesting materials, things are not going to work. So, how do we find interesting materials? You don't know. You don't know what your students are interested in, so ask them. The only way that we can deal with that is have a vast library of interesting materials where something will be interesting to, to someone. Um, we have to approach our students with uh, a, a wide variety of materials. In the chat, I put some links to some free online reading materials. Tomorrow in my talk, I'll be talking about a website which has reading and listening materials, uh, Paul and... Uh, Willie have already mentioned it, it's called ER Central. We'll have a look at that. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say about the teaching of grammar is there's actually not a lot of grammar to teach. Um, if you think about it, a lot of what we call grammar is actually lexis. It's vocabulary, things like the prepositions, for example, conjunctions are much more about lexis, about uh, connections within paragraphs, for example. So if you if a teacher has to think about, do I spend my time on studying a teaching grammar or vocabulary or reading? I want you to ask yourself a question. If you go to Spain tomorrow on holiday. And, you know, no Spanish at all. What book are you going to take with you? A grammar book. Or a dictionary. Dictionary. much prefer, much prefer you spend 
your, that the time you do uh, spending on grammar, spend it on vocabulary, spend it on the high frequency, really important words, not rare and unusual words, really important, high frequency, very useful words. That's where you need to be spending your time. If we have language instruction, it should be on vocabulary. And as Willie said about lexical phrases, lexical chunks, ready-made phrases, collocations, and, and that's very important that we teach that. But we need to make sure students meet them again and again and again and again and again to deepen that knowledge and to build those connections, to build that sense of language, which you cannot do by just teaching students individual pieces, individual pieces, because they're not connected to each other. Every one of them is individual and every one of them is random, like stars in the sky. They're not connected to each other. The way to connect them is through massive, massive input at their level. I think I think it will have to ask about the key words. I think two words. Number one, the reading materials will have to be interesting and enjoyable. And number two, the language level will have to be accessible. Now, in a, in, a, in, a, in a given classroom, chances are you're likely to have a variety, uh, you know, different levels of proficiency in your students. Uh, how do you address that? I think we can find, you know, materials on the same topic, but written, uh, you know, uh, written in different difficulty levels. I think that's one way of doing it. Uh, another way of doing it will be to assign, you know, reading materials from uh, Paul Goldberg's X reading. Yeah, I, if I can add, I mean, this is already mm. said, but I, I, again, I, I and I'm going back to my own analogy, but just if you think about the tennis analogy, no matter how much you, a tennis coach tells their student how to serve, how to use backhand, and even gives them some chances to practice those specific skills, they're not going to become a good tennis player if you don't give them a lot of time to actually get on the court. <clears throat> And play whether it's tennis any other sport music musical instrument art language is a skill you cannot really teach it to people they have to learn it themselves by engaging in it okay no matter uh, this is not quite as, as the same analogy no matter how much you watch football on tv you're not going to become a good football player mm. you have to get there you have to learn the skills but you also have to get on the football pitch and use those skills. It is, it is, it's just the same thing with any language mm. uh, and teachers need to get that into their minds. You know, we, we are educated as our job is to teach things to students, but that's not really the right way. We have to put them in a position to learn the skills mm. and they have to practice the skills to do that. Again, it goes against what we learn as teachers when we do our training, but that's, I think, what it really comes down to. Which, which university are you from, Bulefti? Mm. Uh, State College for Islamic Studies, actually, Pak Wiri. Uh, based in Surabaya? Churuk, Bengkulu. Oh, in Bengkulu. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Mm. All right. Okay, are you, uh, are you happy with the answer, Mem Lefi? Very much happy. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Uh, if uh, Paul said about uh, making an analogy, I usually, most of the time, I... Uh, give this knowledge to my students that language production is like making a cake like uh and the ingredients is like the vocabulary and if you're about to make a cake then where would you get the ingredients you have to go for shop for shopping and where do you shop for vocabulary it's through reading and through listening so that's why i uh tell my students lots of uh, most of the time i tell them this that Okay, it's impossible for you to produce something if you do not read and do not listen. And that's why I put aside the teaching of grammar as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I hope that we can start doing that in the future in our classes and put this really into practice because mm -hmm. this is really an awesome idea. Yes, great. Bulefti, is your university going to adopt X reading just like Jumbar University? We do have, but we leave. We do have a special subject called extensive reading, actually. Oh, very good. Yeah. Yes, but uh, uh, because I'm not at the lectures, so I do not uh, really know exactly mm. what is the curriculum and the lesson plan mm. made by lectures. But I will uh, try to search it later based on this knowledge that I have here. Mm. Very good. Very I think what, what you said reminded me of uh, 
uh, the uh, how how the uh, concept of extensive reading can be interpreted differently by different teachers. I remember doing a small uh, scale study uh, examining a number of extensive reading course books that are widely used in China. Of course, you know, if there are extensive reading course books, then teachers are also teaching extensive reading, uh, you know, in their, in their schools and in their universities. Surprise, surprise, when I look at these course books very carefully, and these are all called extensive reading course books published by major publishers in China and used widely in many different places. Surprise, surprise, when we, me and my, my team, look at their course books very carefully, these are... No, no, these are not uh, extensive reading course books. These are extended reading course books, if you like, or super intensive uh, reading course books. The reading materials are longer, yes, that's right, but the reading materials are very, very sophisticated, very, very uh, difficult. And the tasks, the activities, exactly the same as what we normally see in intensive reading course books. Very difficult questions. And many of the questions are based on Bloom's taxonomy and also the many other uh, you know, classifications of questions, lower uh, order and higher order you know, thinking questions. So speak to your friends or talk to your colleague and find out what materials they are using and whether or not what they're doing in their extensive reading lesson mm -hmm. actually is consistent with what is understood by people like us and also other uh, extensive reading practitioners. Yeah, I, Willie, if I can add, yeah, I had the same experience yeah. with China. I think they, their definition of extensive reading is quite different. I, I think extensive reading can definitely, there's a range, there's a variety, and, and Rob Waring is probably an expert on being able to identify the different kinds of extensive reading, uh, but at its essence, students need to be reading a lot and it should be relatively easy for them. And yeah, I, I was kind of surprised when I found out. I guess to them, extensive reading meant not grammar translation. Mm. And anything that's not grammar translation was extensive reading. Mm. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for all the insights. All right. We do have one last question, I think, from Fritz Suta Are you actually yes. asking? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much for the time. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much for the presentation, everyone. And uh, I uh, am looking forward. Uh, my name is Fritz, and I'm from uh, Maranatha Christian University in Bandung. Um, I'm Willie, really know one of my hey, colleagues. Hey, Fritz, uh, yes. Fenty. Fritz, hey, hello. Hello, Pa, and we met yes. in uh, some seminars before, Pa, Willie. Really. Yes, we and, did, yeah. uh, For Paul, you mentioned about uh, like developing these pre-reading activities, which I think uh, might be very useful. I think it's, it will be useful, actually, as we scaffold the learners or you know, the readers to, to the reading materials itself, right? Uh, so how, how soon do you think you can uh, uh, launch this pre-reading activities? And uh, like, if we don't have that, for example, like manually, I am as a teacher try to scaffold the, uh, the lexical, the, the, the vocabulary gap between the learners and the book. Uh, how many words do you think I should scaffold? <laughs> I mean, uh, given the, the you know, variety of levels of English of my students. So, uh, you know, I don't want to drag it too much, obviously, that it becomes, you know, a disconnected vocabulary lesson and the learners will lose interest even before they start reading, right? Uh, so, yeah, if you have, have any ideas about, like, you know, knowing the limit of <laughs> scaffolding your students' uh, vocabulary knowledge. Thank you very much. Excellent question. I have some good news, actually, that the slide where I said that's an upcoming feature, the slide was a little bit old. So we've, we've actually implemented that uh, last month. Okay, the, the pre-reading. Uh, but we found it is quite challenging for exactly the reason you said. So what we've done is we've taken the glossary words and students can encounter those words, take a short quiz before they start reading the book. The problem is we discovered while we were developing this that some books have a glossary of 50 or 100 words. And as you pointed out yourself, students will get very bored or uh, overwhelmed 
with so many vocabulary words. So we took a step back and we decided instead, a lot of graded readers have a pre-reading section that usually have, I'd say anywhere from five to 12 words. And those are the books we decided to add this pre-reading. So, so I would say, yes, you're absolutely right. It should be a limited number of words, ideally, now, again, the, the point of graded readers, they should be written with controlled vocabulary, but any story is probably going to require a few words that are, are unique for that story. Mm. And those are the words that students should be pre-taught before they start the story. Mm. Okay, uh, So th th that's not the best answer. If, if you email me, I can share with you which books we've done it with. Uh, but yeah, I would say no more than three to five minutes. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. to read. The focus really needs to be on the reading. Okay, so, thank so you. Agree with that? I think Rob is an expert on this. And unfortunately, I'm sorry, I actually have to step out now. I didn't realize we were gonna be speaking this long. So let me take the opportunity to say thank you to everybody. Um, thank you very much, Paul. Hope I can meet you all in person uh, next year when the world is back to normal. Okay, so thank you, I guess thank you very much for inviting thank me. You, thank, thank you, Paul. Thank you very much, Paul. Thanks. See you next time. Okay, everyone, I think this <laughs> is it. Okay, this will be the end, the final end of our today's webinar, which is really exciting and really insightful. Imagine what we are going to be to have tomorrow with Prof. Waring, right? <laughs> he is from Notre Dame Station University. Uh, and we are going to see him tomorrow at 8, 8.30, uh, Prof. And we are going, we're also going to have uh, Kak Daniel, Kak Daniel Adiwidya Tama from ITEL. And yes, we I'm also here. have, yeah, okay, look at Daniel. She <laughs> Glad, to see... Face, Kak. <laughs> Glad to see you <laughs> here, <laughs> Julian. Hello, Kak Wili. Hello. Hello. Hey, Daniel. Hi, Kak Wili. All right, and we are going to have uh, Bu Made uh, from University of Jember as well with you all to tomorrow. Right, so let's hope that you are. Are Bu Made is here, I believe. I see her. All right, so stay tuned to our webinar and tomorrow you're going to be the witness of these wonderful presenters. Uh, Prof Waring, are you about to say something? I'd, I would like to start by, well, I'd like to finish the today by talking about, uh, maybe some of you know, maybe some of you don't know, but this week there is going to be a, a five-day um, online extensive reading conference. And there are over 100 presentations, more than 600 people are going to be attending. It's called Extensive Reading Around the World. And it's an online conference. Uh, many, many people from Indonesia are going to be there. Um, I don't have the URL because I can't post into the chat, but just type extensive reading around the world and you'll find uh, the website. You can sign up and register there. You have to register. I think people from Indonesia, it costs like five dollars, mm -hmm. but um, it's a dollar a day. I mean, that's nothing, about five dollars or so. Um, so uh, please think about extensive reading around the world online conference uh, this week. Uh, two days will be workshops and three days will be full wall to wall presentations about extensive reading, extensive listening. Lots of opportunities for you to ask questions, meet people and so on. Okay. But some fortunate people are, are going to be there for free because they have got a coupon. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Yes. For the people oh, who are great. involved with I the get Indonesia one Extensive <laughs> Reading Association, AIRA. For free. Yeah, Ibu Eka is a key member of IERA. <laughs> Not exactly the key, but <laughs> the members. <laughs> one of the members in IERA. Okay, thanks for the information. Daniel is also one of the know. members in IERA. Yes, yes, I know that, yeah. <clears throat> Everybody see you tomorrow. Okay, see you tomorrow. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, now, everyone, if you were wondering about the uh, certificate link, link to the certificate yeah, or link to the attendance. Yeah, uh, excuse me. Okay. Now you can uh, read the chat, check out the chat over there, and uh, please make sure that the attendance, the link to the attendance will be closed exactly at 1 p.m. sharp, which means that um, no matter what reasons you have, we are not going to uh, reopen the link for you. So I'm, we are really sorry for that. So uh, 
this is just to make sure that everyone that is filling the link is actually participating in this webinar, either uh, through Zoom or through YouTube. All right. All in all, thank you very much. One more time, very big thanks. One thank you is never enough for Pat Willie, Paul, and Prof. Waring, Daniel, Bumade, Buek, and everyone in this room. Uh, Ajar Mintra, thank you very much for giving your testimony. And see you tomorrow in our next webinar. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And goodbye. Have a nice day. No, 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 not goodbye yet. Yeah. Take care of everyone. <laughs> yeah. yeah, officially <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> Officially goodbye, but, but please not leave the room Recording yet. stopped. Because we are going to take pictures of all...